Game begin. Hello and welcome to episode 30, even 30 now, of the Spike Colony podcast. I am here with the never mulliganing Michael J. Flores. I don't never, never mulligan. If I draw the sutured ghoul, I mulligan. But, you know, elsewise, why would you mulligan? And I am your regular CEO of the podcast, a, a appropriate mulliganer, Lanny Huang um big week in pre-modern red green oath Palouche running the tables at two separate tournaments on this very day february 17th uh having a completely clean undefeated run on the magic online challenge uh, hosted by the magic online society as well as a victory in worcester for the uh, massachusetts uh meetup um so congrats to both those pilots and um Fran has been saying the forbidden words of this is the best deck in the format. What do you think? Uh, I told you, I did grudgingly put it in my tier one pile, right? I did I did put it there when we talked about it on X. Uh, it is not the best deck in the format, but I, I, I would grudgingly put it in the, in the, in the, top of the, the top third. I think it's... At least interesting to consider because um, the card Sabo's Web is like the best sideboard card against um, Palouche variants. And it's only a good sideboard card against also the Rock, sort of, and Landstill, sort of. So if you're going to like sideboard Sabo's Web in your deck, it's kind of like a weird, it's like a weird sideboard card if you think about it. Because it's just like not great against... Uh, like there's a few things that it's not great against. I mean, I mean, sorry. There's two. Th- there's two decks. There's one vertical of decks that it's like great against, and then it's like useless against the rest of the format. But, so who cares, right? Like when you sideboard, I don't know. When you sideboard Hydroblast, or you know, like so Hydroblast you know, is, is that Hydroblast doesn't go in against against. Well, Hydroblast is good because it's good against um, goblins and burn. But I'm thinking more like chill. Like chill is like only good against burn, and it's only good against burn for some decks, right? Because you don't side chill in against goblins. No, you have Mox Diamond. No, I don't. I don't. I mean, I would consider it on the play, but it's just too loose on the draw. Because if you draw it instead of um, board presence or interaction, um, then you're like in really bad shape. And then yeah, and goblins like goblins can draw enough mana sources, like. If they get up to like they're five, they're gonna bring in. They're gonna bring in Tranquil Domain against you anyway, right? Uh, depending on the deck that you're playing, I assume that they wouldn't bring in Tranquil Domain if I'm playing Grotog, for instance. Uh, but, but if I'm playing you some have sort engineered of plague, uh, well, that's true. But I guess you're right. So yeah, it's just bad all around. I don't like chill against oh. goblins. I just don't like the the space that it takes. Like I'd board it in if I could board it in for free, but it's not like I'm gonna board out slide of hand for chill, you know. So, but my point is like Sabo's web. So if let's say you're okay, like Hydroblast is good against both goblins and red deck, right? And there are probably other incidental decks that have red mana that you would play Hydroblast against, right? Like you would you would not turn your nose up at Hydroblasting a erratic explosion, right? Like. You would hydroblast a blazing specter. I would hydroblast. Like, I would hydroblast a fling. Um, yeah, but you would hydroblast all those cards. Um, but yeah, so, like I don't know. I mean, Sabo's web has amazing text on it, and that it says draw a card, so that's kind of sweet. Um, the irony is that if you play Sabo's web in your deck, you can't like play any like you can, but you don't want to play any like cycling lands and man lands yourself. Um, but you could play Sabo's web in like. All kinds of decks that right now might have a hard time with Belush variants, right? And then all of a sudden, you're not having so hard of a time anymore because it's. Well, it seems like every deck has a hard time with Belush variants these days. Because yeah, I I don't know. This this just seems fake to me. Like I, it just seems fake to me. I don't know what to tell you. Like you know, my old teammate John Schuler used to be like, if you let's if you look at like NBA statistics, you just like look at how many touches there are on the ball in a single game and then like look at how many touches there are on the ball 
over the course of like 20 games or whatever. But nobody has a good read on how good players are 20 games. And, they, you know, players go up and down and stuff. There hasn't been nearly enough data in the, at the time that he said this, there hasn't even been nearly enough data in the history of Magic the Gathering tournaments to compare to like 20 games of an NBA season. So, like, um, you know, we look at things and you're just like, all right, two nine oh runs certainly seems like it's promising. But I mean, yeah, we have to do it on make for me. We have to do it on vibes. I think the vibes of the red green deck are really high, which is kind of funny because the red green deck is like only like what there's two red cards main deck, so it's roughly two red card it's two cards different in the main deck from the mono green deck. And well, it's I mean, if you discount like let's say you're in a matchup where pyroclasm isn't good. It's just worse than Smokestack. TV Tyrant's deck. Just worse. Just worse than Thursday's deck, right? Like that. That like that's the way that I would look at it. Because like Fran was always just like, oh well, I don't like those decks, but I really like Green White. And then he's just like, okay, I'm gonna put Pyroclasm into those decks, and now it's the best deck. So like that's like a re- that's a very low margin. To well, it's just because the deck wasn't good against goblins. Yeah, but to go from a deck that I don't like at all to I think it's the best deck, I'm like, um, I like. To, uh, a changing of two cards in main deck is actually it's just not enough to do that like um well in games two and three which again are the majority of the games that you play like it matters a yeah, lot more that you have red blast and yeah like pyros uh i had a discussion about changing one or two cards in a deck with vampiric tutor with john finkel right and he said even in a deck with four vampiric tutor you can't uh you can't change the uh win expectation of a deck uh by changing two cards like you can't change you can't change the win expectation of the deck by amount that i was saying that i thought it was was changing yeah but that's probably because you were doing a classic michael j exaggeration yeah Uh, but like like in my in my head if i had a deck that had two copies of enlightened tutor and i added one sabo's web to the main deck that i could tutor for i would feel really good i would feel like that's a very large improvement in my game ones against Polish decks. Both Polish. Yeah, I would agree with that, right? But when you're talking about a deck against the field, you can't just take a deck. Also, the Polish mana is much worse than the TV Tyrant slash slash uh, you know Thursday mana because it has to accommodate red. Like in in the abstract, it's just worse mana base. I agree. Right? So so like you're you're trading like a, like the card Forgotten Cave is not <laughs> not very good in a mono green deck. Right, like you know, so Fran put it in because he had to. He had to balance this other stuff out. But um, I, I'm just saying, like, it's hard for me to wrap my head around this. I don't like this deck at all. To yeah, yeah, I two. I agree. Right? So this is a big. This is Austin, what I would say. Giant- yeah, I mean, I have it written up. I recently updated my my tierless Google Doc, and uh, I just put the red green Oathblush deck in. Um, in the needs more data section simply because I was like, well, I don't think the mono green vert like deck was like great. You know, I thought it was like a good playable deck. Like it's probably better than the rock, but, um, it was like, okay. So like, is it, so do you fix the elves and goblins matchup? Um, lost it a little bit to some other matchups. Like, did that, did that just like literally solve all the problems of the deck? Cause like it was well, the only thing that was there's holding just, it back was there's just no way that's true. Right. Like, so you have to consider pilot Fran is the champion of champions. Okay. Like it, it, let's say there was a deck and okay. Oh, this is a great example. Right. Um, uh, shout out, shout out to Yasa Oka is a pro tour champ. I think he's a two time pro tour champion. Right. And the reputation is no one can win with Shouts' decks, right? He's winning Pro Tours with like his Tap Out Dragons deck or something, right? I mean, I I could, right? Like I also made Tap Out Dragons decks that people couldn't win with, right? But I'm like, I ran the tables in Utah, for example, and people are like, I your deck can't ever win a game. I'm like, you don't know how to play, right? That that's the that's like the exact same thing people would say about Shouts' decks, right? I I would accept that the average player has like a way worse win expectation with a shout to Yasaoka deck than shout to Yasaoka, a two-time Pro Tour champion, has with them. And, like, his decks perform on the Pro Tour, obviously, because he wins Pro Tours, but they, they're they not the kind of deck that ever does well in the PTQ season afterwards, right? Like, they're not the 
decks that people are latching onto that are winning a lot of blue envelopes and stuff like that. Well, the um, confounding so, the ca- confounding counterpoint here is that two non Fran pilots just won <laughs> won tournaments with this deck. No, no, I, I so fair enough. But what I'm saying is that like you have to control for you have to control for player to some degree. Fran is the champion of champions. He's not. He's not like a random dude with a random deck, right? And like when we talk about decks, where it's like when you say something like, okay, I guess mono green, you know, Ponza Oath is better than the rock, you're saying that a random dude with mono green Ponza Oath is a more dangerous opponent than a random dude with the rock. That's that's what you're saying, right? You know, like And I would be right. But <laughs> Yeah. But but what you're but what the the fact pattern in front of us isn't a random dude with a random deck. The fact pattern in front of us is the champion of champions with a deck that he's put all of his time and thought into, right? Like, so it might not be as good as the results are saying. It's just got like a really, I think, really, I think it's like extremely really, really compelling. Like, it's like handing Etai blue white dreadnought and him him getting second place, know, dude, man. Right? Blue white dreadnought is the best deck, right? Like, but that that's just not hard to wrap your head around. Well, that's like, a, I mean, that's not hard because it's clear to see how powerful the blue white deck is. Yeah, but like but the red, if, I, I'm just saying it's a very good case if for Dave two Kaplan other ever pilots. lost a match in the regular season. I would think maybe, blue, you know, like, but it's just so consistent. Like Mike Harris just like rolls up and gets, you know, this identification of role as being a hermit fed player. And he's, oh, just kidding. You know, meddling mage on sword supply shares rock and roll, you know, so. I think like even if you foolhardy hard fool foolhardy, foolhardy, foolhardy didn't think blue white was the best twelve twelve variant, right? Like I at one point was just like, well, I think blue white is an opportunistic deck, right? So my argument was it is an opportunistic deck and it's it's better to play because it is an enormously advantage heads up matchup with mono blue, right? But if mono blue didn't exist you just play mono blue, right? I was wrong, okay? But I at least understood that some version of 12-12 was like the most powerful thing that you could do. Yeah, yeah, giving yourself a lot of points for being close to correct. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just saying like this is this is like like it's not hard to get into the gravity well of this of this star, okay? I think like a deck that takes a million turns to win that has 30 mana just has a lot of structural issues that makes it hard for me to wrap my head around it being the best. Yeah, but right? I mean, like, it, it might be, but that's probably not the I best think, as I think, a result. It's I not think, that it's not good. No, that's, no, no, no. There's another option. The other option is to examine what's wrong with you. <laughs> like, you're the no, pie. I'm not, I'm it's not you. You're the problem. <laughs> like, I, it, it might be a time to, to take a good hard look in the mirror and just be like, Michael J, maybe, just maybe, there's something that you're not seeing in the picture in your deck evaluation like nope i'm just i'm just saying it's just like i mean we don't get a lot of swiss tournaments uh in pre-modern and i think the best thing that you could have said that you've that you failed mention is simply it's like uh people don't really know what their strategy is to defeat this deck and i think Uh, that would be like i mean people are not hunting it right like so if you think of like us going to lobster con last year we had a 147 different ways we were going to attack 12 12s right we had 100 we, we failed ways. we failed in that regard too 57 ways we were going to attack land tax you know we had our plans for beatdown decks right like i i uh i lost to like the mirror match to the eventual champion and my other swiss loss was uh was to uh, getting a land boomeranged and then a flooded strand interdicted uh, against a first turn black vice. Those those are my two losses in the Swiss. So uh, I don't know. You know. Yeah, I mean, you should have uh, you should have thought about you should have thought about that happening before you rolled up with a deck where the average mana before. cost is seventeen. Um, well, I mean, it, I, actually, I lost to black vices twice because I lost to Selden, Selden sided black. Selden, by, yeah, Selden had vice. Yeah, so I yeah, I lost the. <laughs> to blue black vice decks i didn't have a plan for blue black vice but um i you know i beat the red decks i played against and people are like oh red deck is great against landstill yeah. i beat the elves decks i played against people are like oh elves is great against landstill i beat the enchantress deck i played against i don't know i beat i beat those kind of decks 
I won, I won other mirror matches. I happened to lose the one to, to Brian. And then I, uh, I, I went to time with Godfather. But um, yeah, you there know. you go. I mean, I think that it's interesting to like, I don't know. I'm in the same spot, honestly. I'm just like, the deck is very difficult to exploit. Not saying that you can't do it, but it's not like if you are a like burn player, like, I guess if you're a burn player, you just have to have Sabo's web because this deck has not lost a burn on, on at the hands of like any pilot. I don't like not a single, it. not a single loss to burn uh, for Fran, um, uh, Asian Ninja 93 um, also managed to uh, yeah, when one of them beats me, I'll believe it. How about that? that well, that's going to be, mine. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's just uh, like, no, nobody thinks that green white is a good matchup, right? uh for for that pollution variant and well that's that's because circle red well no that's just because like the stone rain is a lot better against burn than cataclysm i mean like like if you have if you have the draw of like sphere of resistance into stone rain stone rain or what or some you know some permutation of that like you're in a lot better shape um and then you know the rest I of the mean, like you have you have pyroclasm, I, which actually does which actually man, does I, more work than uh source of plowshares against most. I beat, I beat fire ice chill Armageddon the last time I was in this spot, which is a hell of a lot scarier than than uh pyroclasm sphere of resistance uh stone rain, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I just don't I just don't think it's real. Like the the like I. I I, it's not that I don't think that red green Palouche is a real deck. I like I told you, I think it's a tier one deck. I just don't believe that it beats red, right? Like, I just don't see how that's possible. Like, I I've played both of the decks, and I think it's way more likely that the red pilot was <laughs> wasn't operating correctly than you know. Well, that's tale as old as time. I think um, you have a long history of not having much faith in red pilots that aren't yourself. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah. When I unfortunately when I'm you only that, play, <laughs> unfortunately you only play, uh, you know, a handful of matches of pre modern per per week, um, which is on the rise. But you don't get that much uh, red time. I, I mean, just, look, I, as as far as I'm concerned, like if I only have to worry about Michael J playing red, if I'm playing red green oath blush, and you're not playing red, or you don't live in my jurisdiction. <laughs> And I'm just not going to say that I lose to red. Like, you see it, what I'm saying here? It's just like, you're just like, just like, I alone have the solution for the red deck no, to I win. Mean, it's like, well, that's good for I you. But that just means I that. I think that I alone have a solution. That's different from me saying that I think that people aren't playing right. Right. So like, like when I was testing that one night with Itai and he's just like, well, everybody knows Murktide beats red. And I'm like, no, this is like an automatic matchup for red. You can never lose. And we played 10 games and he won two. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's like, I, I, like I, he's I, just like, yeah, this matchup is a blowout. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, uh, I understand Mike, I'm just telling you that it just doesn't matter. Like it actually doesn't matter if, if my goal is to just like win the match and I'm not playing against you. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, no, I'm just saying like, I, so this is the thing that I, I took, from Adrian Sullivan that was a bad is is the word heuristic or I don't so when we were on a team in the 90s Adrian's testing rule was because we we always we always tested like we didn't exist in the metagame like we were ex- like the metagame existed and we existed outside the metagame right so decks were different back then so like it wasn't like oh, i'm gonna play stock red green against stock mono red right like we would choose like the stock decks we thought were popular and then we would play our ro- cabal rogue decks against them. you know some of which became important strategies in in the greater magic universe but adrian's whole shtick was we don't exist in the metagame so we have to ab- abide by certain rules right like the opponent in some ways was when you were playing the other side you were not allowed to make the right play if the right play required knowledge of the secret deck. Yeah, of course. So like, yeah, so it's just like, well, I, this is the right play. But well, you're not allowed to make that play because you don't know that I have, I don't know, hunting Moa or whatever, some weird shit we would have had in, in our army. Games, right? Like whatever weird cards, right? Like, okay, you can't make this play. So um, that's different than um, like a red pill player just not, operating correct like i don't know we were playing earlier tonight you were just like oh you used your mana efficiently i'm like yeah i guess that's among the things that i, I know how to do 
<laughs> but that's not something that, you know, maybe people don't do that every time. It just... If you just look at the two decks, line them up against each other, one of the decks is all one drops and cards that deal three points of damage or four points of damage, and the other deck is all three drops and non-basic lands. Like, it's not real if the red-green deck is beating the red deck. Like, there's something horribly wrong with the red player. That's the only, that's the only conclusion you can come to. Just, like, line these soldiers up. Right, like I have three things out before you cast your first thing, right? Like, that's yeah. But all we have to, you have a, but all we have to go on. I mean, it's the problem is like if you play it, like it's more useful, like for for people who've had their hands on matchup. It's like Fran isn't going to like seed the red matchup until he actually starts losing to it because, like, again, like I understand what you're saying. Like, I understand that you can look at two decks and think that one deck can win. In fact, you've did that today. And yeah, but I, you might I have lost you, you might for have an hour so that I could get you in the so that you I can, could get you, you can the, you can ignore um, data as much as you uh, as much know. as you want. When I said we were playing for all the marbles. <laughs> A two oh went pretty quick. Um, but regardless, like, I think, again, there's there's. There are things that you learn by playing matchups and there are things that you learn fr- by looking at deck lists and you need both in order to make an informed judgment. So like, yeah, I understand I your you, position, but you're, you you're play, missing, right? Yeah. You're missing, you're missing the data that'd be gained from playing. And like, you know, b- until that happens, like, I'm just going to be like, well, I think scoreboard like Fran and others have failed to lose to burn. Um, so it's like looking pretty good. Both players uh, had to fight against Burn in the top eight of the both the challenge and in Worcester. If I'm not correct, I'm going to do a little scrolling in Discord. Um, but um, yeah, I was hearing that yeah, top four was yeah, top four was Burn against um, Burn Red against Green. Red Green and Red Green won. So uh, yeah, the Asian Ninja <laughs> probably the Burn to, deck had all snow covered mountains. Yeah, maybe that's. Yeah, he, he's that's just that. like one. He's like, I just, can't believe I got caught with snow covered mountain. Yeah, I got messed up. I, I I think that the red green deck as Fran put it together is very beautifully tuned, as as well tuned as a deck with thirty mana sources can be. But it's just it just has such it has such huge structural problems for me. Like I have a really hard time wrapping my I head think, around. I think four Sylvan Library. I think four Sylvan Library is actually just like fi- just actually fixes all the problems. Okay, the deck. this is a great example, right? Like Sylvan Library is a non-issue if you're playing against a red deck. You can't draw any extra cards. Let's let's so not gives, let's not gives, let's not get distracted a, here. I'm telling you, it gives that you a Sylvan, one-time look at two extra cards, Mike, and you spent. Mike, let's time. not get distracted here. I'm just saying that Sylvan Library is like solved like. You know, essentially, like you just play four of them and then you draw it and then you're able to have enough agency. Like it's like kind of a planeswalkery effect. Like, sure, it's not a scry, but like, you know, you have four shuffles and you can always go three deep and then you go three deeper when you get a shuffle and you have the option to pay life. So like no, I, in a given I do like that, it has a way to control its draw versus the previous version. It just was drawing I, cards off the top of its. I think it makes a huge. Fingers crossed. I think it makes a massive difference when you're talking about the problem of like, okay, well, uh, you know, this deck has 31 mana sources. Um, all of a sudden, with the Sylvan Library in play, the deck no longer behaves like a deck with 31 mana sources. Well, like then, could, then one of your mana sources clears out too, right? So like the four of your four of your land draws clears out, uh, you know, clears out two dead cards, and then you have pay for life to clear dead cards and then you have you know and then you you have just like pick up the third from the bottom part of my dissatisfaction comes from the fact that i've lost a match with red green uh, yeah I yeah you you had one bad, bad sylvan you know situation and I, like I, it's tainted it's forever sylvan, it's like forever and, tainted your experience but this is the problem with the michael j judgment is that you're always you're always I have three wooden foothills also. You always have very, very, very small anecdotal samples, just like completely tainting the data nobody, for you in the Nobody head. has statistically significant samples in the human world so of playing that. But that doesn't nobody mean does. that doesn't mean that you should put so much weight into like like demonstrably statistically insignificant samples. Because the oh, thing I, is you can I just care run about my experience much more than everybody else's you can, experience. You can, I don't know who doesn't. You can run I mean I mean it's just like simple It's just like it's like this card looks like this card lets you look at three cards on your draw step three is more than one like 
That's that's yeah, just you, it. So, a I said I do agree that that is better than the previous version, who just crossed its fingers and drew whatever was on top of its deck. I agree with that. However, that's not a particularly good card against red, which was the thing we were talking about before. And the thing that I, I wasn't arguing Sylvan Library was good against red, though. I was telling you that yeah. Sylvan Library solves one of the structural like it was it was a like big leap for like just a fourth copy, right? I think a fourth copy, you draw it, you know, whatever, 33 percent more often than you would have. Not exactly, obviously, but you just draw you just draw it way more if you have four and then you have two copies, you know, when one gets removed. It's just like just that change, like made the entire vertical of this like oath deck that much better because the the other impact right is that this deck is slow as molasses we've like we've talked about how slow this deck is a huge problem but one nice thing about being a slow deck is that you just get infinite sylvan value right each turn you're recurring well, value it's like the closest you can get to a planeswalker in pre-modern because you get this not really for free. it has a it, it's a it's a declining what, what's it's not a bell curve right it's it's this shape people can't see the shape that i'm making because you just stop you just stop having things that are worth drawing uh like at some point in the game well you like, get you get resets you get resets on every fetch land no but you're just your deck stops having things that are worth drawing right like you you just have like another stone rain or or like or you have a it, it super depends on what the other person's side of the battlefield looks like right but your your deck has basically no powerful cards that's one of the things that yeah but problem with I so I, I don't want to have I don't want to have okay I mean I listened back no, to no, our if podcast your opponent episode cooperates with oath then it Mike looks Mike like it I understand really I understand don't like this is what I want to mention about yeah. this which is which is uh, we had this discussion last week and you you essentially made an argument that uh, that I'm going to summarize which is just that yeah. you make the argument that engines are better than the rock okay like if your deck has an engine you're better than the rock like i like listen to it back which is like I, had this all, i probably believe that but i don't remember saying you 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 basically like i'm just making the one-liner like if people wanted to skip the two-hour episode that happened yeah uh that got released last thursday um like it basically comes down to i'm like okay well i think the card oath of druids is good like i think that i don't think stone rain is good but i think stone rain is always going to trade with a land right like is stone rain better than survival of the fittest like can stone rain scale better than survival of the fittest like obviously not but the reason why this deck works and the reason why again it's like a good version of the rock is because despite the fact that any engine in in pre-modern uh can can conceive of like you know engines such as say goblin ringleader well uh, there's actually not that many engines like the engines are uh gush survival of the fittest um, this is not an engine it's just a card that draws two it's like cards. It it's like it cost nothing it's like the closest that we can get to an engine right because if you no, gush no, no. into gonna, another if you gush into another gush then that's an engine i'm gonna, right? I'm gonna call you on this one because you said that i just like dividing by zero gush is just divination okay but you get to do it for zero right it's my favorite thing so but it's not an engine right like survival of the fittest is an engine you know like oh. uh yeah i mean i know i know it's like not inherently an engine but the thing is like survival of fittest like then survival of fittest and what was formerly uh tax rack like become the only remaining engines like besides like standstill draws impulse impulse into another I standstill mean, i think like i think like the rifter setup is very engine-ish right like that it's like very engine it's like, like me i i i it's an engine so much as like grotog has the sleight of hand into no. gush into engine like it's Grow the same thing is, the cards draw cards Grow and deal damage cards that are that are like a little bit of like one plus one equals three like but but this that's is a, only because the inherent cards are like but I'll, less than less i'll, than I'll, I'll bring this back to earth like the the the, the thing that makes red green work in the pre-modern environment is because of the distinct lack of engines and the fact that all the engines get answered by naturalize right so you're like oh well you're not drawing anything good with your draw steps like neither is your opponent nobody is drawing good cards the cards are bad like you just open up your seven you hope they work good like red green just slices them out that way at all the, i mean i'm just like the like the the thing is like, like your opponent is talking your opponent is just like, like top decking the, lands and you like you you know you've got them like locked under under port and like whatever it's just like, like and then they the can cast I, maybe one spell one of the things i find very curious about about red green oath pollution and then you're like oh actually fran lost to that right and it's just like i think that the card 
Sphere of Resistance is awesome in this deck. And if you and like, there's some there's some situations where like the sphere feels pretty bad. And like my singular reason that I don't just want to play Dreadnought decks all the time is I don't want to lose to somebody who's way worse than me who happened to who have just has Sphere of Resistance. resistance. I've got bad yeah, news. So I just, you have bad news about Grow Talk. <laughs> right so i just don't want that's just not the experience i want to have because like i hate like i hate it if my opponent just has some donkey car that's like not even that good but it happens to crush me right like so and that's that's too broad of a statement to make about service is obviously a very powerful card right but i just don't like this feeling and i feel like i don't want to like be in this stupid situation where my low mana low resource deck that has a sweet you know plan a is now at least four mana, super sucky. Like we played a lot of games where, you know, it was hard for me to win if you had two spheres or something, but I still did sometimes. But like the the thing about sphere of resistance against against twelve twelve is like outside of sphere of resistance, did you just lose? Like yeah, this deck you like this deck is pretty you poor. Straight up lose. This deck is right? much so the best deck. Of the- this deck is much worse against uh, Dreadnought, but if Dreadnought it, hasn't it, been showing up in the meta. I don't think either. If you're like Plan A is like humiliatingly bad against the cards Days and Gush, and people can play cards like if they wanted to, right? They can play cards like Teferi's Response or Misdirection. Those cards are in the meta game, right? Like, but like that that's like seems super weird to me right like i yeah i, I want to those are those are things i definitely agree that i don't like about the deck but i did want to wrap the point about you were saying which is like uh your sylvan is like decreasing in quality because of the cards you're drawing i'm just saying like i don't think that your opponent is exponentially improving while you linearly improve like yeah but you, they didn't you, spend a card well i mean sylvan library is just four life away from washing the card and then once you pay the next four life you're ahead and that, that's actually so, huge like so, so sylvan sylvan divination died. sylvan divination as into scry 2 like you know into scry 2 afterwards with the fetch land is like it puts you insanely ahead for for a window of like I three or four remind turns mind you that i didn't make top eight at sacred torch because I gave my Cloud of Fairies beatdown opponent eight time walks yeah, I, by using my I don't, I against don't, the Cloud of Fairies. I don't really need. I don't really need to like. I don't. Uh, I don't think. It I don't wrong. need you to remind me that you're bad and like you think cards are bad because you don't know how to play them correctly. Like Lan and I are just watching this game and just like what like what changes like what cards. That's the thing is like you're so. Like watching you in that situation, and that was with Landy Hoth, right? Which has like cards like yeah. Mulch or whatever. You're like thinking to yourself, like I have to pay eight life here because I'm so tired of just drawing not a card. And I think that's your problem. Yeah, it's because like I had the magical as, Sylvan in play. As soon as a, it's it's poster says I'm supposed to get good draws. As soon as you miss, as soon as you miss a draw step, like Sylvan doesn't like fix every single draw step. It just fixes just enough, and it's better. Oh. It gives you a better draw step than you that, than you did before. And with the so deck, I, the plan is to take a lot of draw steps. Like you should take comfort in the fact that on your next draw step you get. A look at the third card down and you just get to keep doing that and then if your back is completely to the wall then you can like sink your extra four life or whatever but your deck has gaia's blessing i don't know why you're just like ch- not just chilling just like waiting till you find two three guys blessings or or four windswept so i think like red green oath pollution is substantially better than green i don't it's called magical christmas land death to me i think that deck is substantially better than green white oath pollution uh, I I never really felt like I would ever want to play green white of the I think red green I would want to play it more frequently but it just seems super weird to me that like it's turn 15 I have a sylvan library in play and the best thing I can do is rip a thermo cars that just seems weird that's all I'm saying right like there's just no powerful cards to draw in the long term so if your opponent isn't that's, already crippled that's just on resources true. you're not going to win that's just true of like like that's no, what I'm telling you is true it's like all the cards designed to play for 30 turns not drawing powerful cards that's just not true the only powerful like, cards in the format is survival of it is <laughs> like that's no, the only that's, good card like survival of it is and call of the herd and enchantress don't no shut up sh- just stop talking no enchantress is allowed no enchantress okay. talk is allowed because encha- like, like we've we've talked about enchantress like I don't like do you not think ball lightning and fire blast are powerful cards I mean like the 
Like, I mean, I don't think I don't ball know. lightning is good under a sphere of resistance port. And, I don't think it's good under a sphere of resistance. That wasn't the question. I said, don't you think those are powerful cards? I mean, I, like they're not. Fire blast is powerful, right? Because it's free and you can like always cast it, and it gives you threshold, and it gives you two mountains for Grim Lava Mancer. But so, yes, ball lightning kind of sucks. Like ball lightning is the farthest away from value. Like you're just like this card is two bolts stapled together, but only if your opponent doesn't have a removal spell of any kind that exists. Like a vendetta, Randy, a vendetta gets a ball lightning. Like come on, Randy, I love you, and I think I think you don't know how to land a ball lightning. I talk talk <laughs> about I, I, Mike, that, that, everything I've heard just now is. I don't know how to land a ball like like it, it's you might need to invite the possibility that your opponents don't know how to stop you from landing a ball lightning like if I'm the rock and there's a vendetta in my hand I've never like I've never it's like um uh I'm just like never not leaving black up yeah we're in a parallel universe where my red deck might lose to the rock right now sure. <laughs> I'm okay. just I'm just telling whatever you, you say later. like I'm not not holding up a plow like I I, I think a lot of people might be losing to you on you Red Deck. Perhaps Day. read who's the beatdown because I'm not holding up a plow. It's a great way to lose to the jackal. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know what to tell you. It might. I'm, I'm telling you that maybe your opponents are throwing against you when you're playing burn. That's giving you an inflated sense of how good the burn deck is. If that's the case, they've been doing it for 20 years, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, Please that's, that's probably that's probably what it is. Given given the Given the breadth of opponents, right? Because you haven't had a you haven't had a chance to to play at the top tables for some time. It's been a little it's been a little while. I don't know. I had a lot of feature matches with uh, my red deck at Pro Tour Magic Origins. How many ball landings was there? Was in that deck? None. No. Oh, okay. None. Okay. I had I had other expensive cards though. We had Exquisite Firecraft and Stoke the Flames. Exquisite Firecraft, the card that with the with, that you can't play around, the card that says can't be countered on it, the card that's probably a lot harder to misplay than Ball Lightning. It's like, I, oh, my I, opponent's I at four. I have Spell Mastery. I, I they have the Blue Mana. I and Reduke with that card. That doesn't surprise <laughs> me one bit. They had a, they had islands open. They probably were holding up. They probably were holding something up, thinking that they're safe. Regardless, you can, if you want, if you want to watch a red a red mirror played perfectly. You can watch me against. You can't uh, find that. You Sam can't Ball. find this match. You can't find this match. You can link it for our listeners, but you can't find it. It's ungoogleable. Me and Sam. Yeah, you can't find it. Not really. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, bro. SCG took it down. No, it's it's a Pro Tour match, not an SCG. Okay. Match. Well, Magic the Gathering took it down then. Uh oh. Well. Um, regardless, um, I don't think Ball Lightning is a good counterexample to like viable top decks, and like the point. Like the point again is, um, yes, the burn deck in its construction, um, it's not an engine, but is built such that all of its cards um, uh, serve the one goal, right? Uh, very much like a survival deck contains 30 creatures. So if you have a survival of the fittest in play and you draw a creature and it's just it just has type creature, then it's like a great draw. Or it doesn't matter because you have a survival in play, so that means you have a squeak in your graveyard. But if the survival deck gets uh, naturalized and and pyroclasmed or is like under oath plus naturalized. Then all of a sudden it's a deck with a bunch of cards with type line creature. And then it's draws start looking a lot worse oh, than the elves. The elves deck that doesn't have a survival in play is two deranged hermits from being completely unplayable. Right. Like it's just horrible. And and that's like that's just the point that I'm trying to make is like these like I one engine decks in in pre modern right now are not in the best place that they've been um, like again it's really hard to evaluate because one the the land tax engine no longer exists which leaves just the survival of the fittest engine and uh, the survival of the fittest engine is like at least fair in the sense that it relies on you like playing creatures um except for like if you're hermit fab in which you can just like kill your opponent one turn from no battlefields but that's neither here nor there um uh, well, hermit fab can't do that from no battlefield they they at least need a hermit or a survival yeah 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 i'm saying no creatures on the battlefield uh which makes them good against like you know plowshares is not great against hermit fab it's like playable but it's not great but it's all right i'm just like saying it's like all these pre-modern decks is like like uh, your draw step just 
like some decks have better draw steps than others. Like some some decks are capable of top decking ball lightning when their opponent has zero cards and six life. And like that's obviously good. Thank God. I'm not I'm not saying that's not good, but just think about like think about the best card that you can top deck like both players at zero zero cards. Is it is it like really is Thermocars actually really that bad if like you're drawing into eight of them and you can draw multiple if, for turn okay, and your so, opponent's under like sphere in Rishon port and the big right, so, upside is that you can draw any like combination of these cards and normally it's good enough right like yeah, ports but, plus so, sphere is pretty good so the thing that you're talking about is the situation where the thermocars is pretty good because it's in a family of seven other thermocars and sphere of resistance right so and rich and port and rich and port and yeah. wasteland so, i mean so, just if you conceptualize another land instead of attacking your opponent's life points you're just attacking like your opponents like the no, 20 no, lands I, that so started in the I, i'm i'm just going to respond to what you're saying which is like you know something's going pretty well for you and you draw this and it's relevant on like turn whatever right i i don't know is lightning bolt not better like because if i was operating at the same at the same just level of like my cards are pretty relevant i don't know why you're still alive right like all uh, all my one shots for one mana just kill you so like that's the thing that i don't understand like i could literally just peel a one casting cost card off the top of my deck hold a land back and only play it when it's when it's relevant so that i can't get too too badly thermal cards did and i will literally kill you with any seven random cards in my deck before you can kill me if I don't let you trigger Oath. Right, but that's, like, that, like again, that that's one, that's no, just... no other possible... But, but Burn is the only deck that's constructed like that. Like, no, every, other deck, I, uh, every other deck every other deck relies on more than how one they're mana. losing. Yeah, right? but like, let's just let's just set that aside, because, again, we're not... we Like, we can't... We literally can't pass... You can't... You can't feasibly pass judgment on it without playing the match. And, like, I'm, I'm just not going to spend more time... Like trying but to trying the green white version versus versus Mike, red. Mike, like, I'm not going to spend I'm not now. going to spend more time arguing about the red green. Like I'm not going to spend more time arguing about a match that you've never played because it's just like it's just pointless. Just go play the match and then we'll come back and we'll tell people like what we learned, right? But there's no point in talking about it. It's like okay, like you think that we know that you think that, but like let's like focus on the topic at hand, which is just saying like um. Like it, maybe it would help you to conceptualize that Oath Pollution is just a burn deck that like burns lands instead of spaces, and like it's it's draw step Thermocar starts looking a lot better, and that's like one of the core functionalities of the deck is just that like instead of having Cataclysm Plow Disenchant like whatever other stuff in its range like Exalted Angel in its range, which like Exalted Angel is better than Thermocarst, but not if not if you've cast. <laughs> Um, two other thermal all the different cards that are better than thermal <laughs> I, I, I don't have a huge problem with red green magical Christmas land death. I love that. I, I put it in the top tier. I just don't think it's the best deck. And there's just some matchups that I can't wrap my head around how you could ever lose. So like, you know, maybe it's a limitation on my part, a deck that takes at least 20 turns to win versus any seven random cards in my deck. I don't understand how they can't win. That's a weird thing to me. I could take any seven cards in my deck and just yeah, but, do them to one land at a time but and you've, I win the game. You've seen it first but your hand. Your deck Mike. that attacks 20 times is, is going to beat me ever. But there's okay. there's Makes also no there's also like like I don't know, 18 matches with this deck like on record no, on Fran's YouTube it, channel. Like what do you what happens to you when you're watching every single one of those matches that he's winning? Are you just like watching him I mean, win I every match? I watch a lot of magic players playing YouTube. And I can tell you that I actually, somebody offered me coaching recently. I actually watched a bunch of his videos and I sent him seven messages today. And I said, I know you offered me coaching, but I know you have a big tournament coming up. And I watched a lot of your videos and here are the seven things that are bad about your game. And like, you lose a lot of games to these play patterns, right? And it's, a, it's the same thing. I like, I, I'm just like, people don't, they, they don't, I don't know. You said to me last week, that I focus on my end game too much, and I ended up losing that way in a top four match the next day, right? So I actually, I'm going to see how, to what degree I can take that to heart. But my assumption is, it's actually not that people say the wrong thing. They say, um, they say somebody threw, or they say, like, somebody screwed up or something. The only thing I can imagine is that the red players are cooperating with the red players. But let's, Mike! That like, Mike! Mike, listen to me. I said, I don't want to litigate the red matchup. I'm asking you 
You're, you asked me what I think when I see people play. You didn't. No, I'm asking you what you think when you see Fran play the deck and when like the, the, the deck is on record with with hours. I've never of, I don't remember ever seeing Fran playing as a red deck. I'm not I've asking never, you about the red deck for crying out loud. Oh, Mike, against I'm not a mother. Mike, he goes three and three in some of the videos. Later. He He's went six. He goes in three and match. three. He goes three and three and exactly one. And he has enough wins on his YouTube. The reason why I'm asking because you're just like, I don't understand how that deck wins games. If in your brain, the only no, no, game no. that exists I never is against. Said, <laughs> I never said I don't understand how the deck wins games. I never said that. I said, I don't understand how it beats the red deck. I also said, I don't think it's the best deck in the format. I understand how it wins games. People are idiots like me. They keep a two land hand <laughs> against a land destruction deck and they wonder three turns later, how come they never played any spells, right? Like people just, I look in the abstract, you look at your hand and you're like, okay, uh, my heuristic is I keep two land hands. You're often going to lose to, to uh, Fran's deck on any sentence that starts with, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep this two land hand. Also, I said this to you when we were testing earlier. I think Francic is an unusually good Mox Diamond deck. And it's actually, it's weird because it doesn't have very good Mox Diamond recovery, but the fact that it can just get Sphere of Resistance out against a more powerful deck is super meaningful because it allows them to steal play to some degree, right? So there's games where it's like your opponent's on the play, and if you don't have Sphere of Resistance, they literally just beat you there, right? But if you have Sphere of Resistance that you can play on the first turn, they just don't beat you, right? Like if you're playing against 12-12, right? I'm like, all right. I'm going to go off here, and I have a vision charm in my hand, so even if you have the naturalize, I'm protected. Sphere of Resistance prevents you from being able to do that, and that is only facilitated by Mox Diamond. The, the deck generates a ton of virtual card advantage by making the opponent's cards that they have in hand uncastable, right? Like, so if you draw a, if you draw a ton, uh, if you actually, if you just draw like a couple of, of uh, Thermocarts and you have a Sphere of Resistance in your in, in in play, it's like you mind twisted your opponent. I understand all of those things. The thing I don't like about it is you can get that situation going and then 10 turns go by and I don't know how in the games that 10 turns go by that the opponent didn't figure out a way to recover. Well then, but and that's like, the thing. This is this is what I'm telling you, which is that the fact that you don't know and the fact that there are plenty there's plenty of available things that like available games for you to reference on record means that you need to answer why like you need to answer why like 18 times right so we so had a player we, we played let, a game. let me finish the thought of like yep. let me, a player just went 9-0 right another player just went you know whatever won a tournament right and then fran has um fran has like 18 matches on record and in 18 he's like you know 14 and 4 or whatever so at the very least, if you hold this position where you're just like, well, how does Fran win playing 10 turns? You need to you need to explain 14 times for games on record, like like what the mistake the opponent made or like, you know, what the structural thing is like. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like the, so, the, you, you need to start from a place of just like, I'm likely to be wrong. You should be asking, why am I wrong? Not like so what is wrong with I'll everyone just, else? I'll just raise two things. One of them was like, we played a lot of games and you were playing the red green magical Christmas land death deck. And you said a bunch of times, you're just like, oh, I should have been attacking you earlier in, instead of prisoning. You, right. Like that's the thing you're like, oh, I think that this is a thing that I'm going to have to improve. Right. So that that was an observation that you made from your side. Right. I think that from from the other player side like they can make they can in a game of magic you make one mistake and then that costs you the game right like you can just make a structural mistake where you do the same wrong thing over and over and over again it's going to hyper compound that the very first game we played i like just got hyper focused on something I'm, and i just missed the fact that i had a turn to 12 12 and i was looking to concede i'm like oh never mind i won't concede it and i ended up winning one of these games i because 10 turns went by you didn't kill me so i just killed you right like it, it, I understand it didn't win all the games, but like that was a good example. Right, but of, your like, deck you have all your prison elements. Your, your deck, and, your deck has that. Your deck had that capability, and we can't leak your deck. But it's a, it's an unnamed combo deck, right? And your deck has that capability to go from, um, you know, a position where no position when it's dead. Yeah, no position to some position, right? And the thing is, like most decks don't have that ability that aren't combo decks. Like even, um. So, like even the dreadnought deck, if it's like under spheres, all of a sudden combo plus plus foil gush protection like becomes super super hard. And so, 
what you really wanted to talk about, I feel like we just argued about something that neither of us care about for like the first hour of this podcast. No, I care about it because I need I need you to change your analysis structure because I'm never going to change my position on this. It's not going to happen. And I'll tell you why, because I'm not wrong. <laughs> and the 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 thing about the deck, one of the things that's really good about the deck is that it is attacking the metagame at a time when people are wholly unprepared for it. But if people just started playing the cards that are generally good against it, it would lose a massive amount of of percentage because of, because of two things. One, its cards aren't very powerful. So like if people were bringing very powerful cards against it that are just aimed to try to beat them, then they're like, okay, you're bringing like a thermonuclear warhead that costs one or two mana and I still have thermocarst, right? Like that's one thing. And then the other thing is um it just it just has so much mana and if you're playing games that take 20 turns to win, your opponent has the opportunity to draw their powerful counter spells, not just not you you counter spells, their their counterplay cards that don't currently exist but will exist over time. If the deck if yeah. the deck is a real I mean, part of the I, game. I absolutely agree in the sense that uh, two Sabo's webs gets the same amount of distance as four chills. Um, you know, when it comes to how this deck is um, constructed and I, and like, don't get me wrong. Like I do think that if a deck uh, shows up and people uh, start respecting it by having the right sideboard cards or having, uh, having an adapted strategy, like those are things that um, are going to have a huge impact. And I think I, I, and then it just becomes a question of whether or not the red green deck can, you know, adapt back and have a strategy that, that is able to fight back against, um, what if you think that people's reaction is going to be two Sabo's webs, right? I think the red green deck will be about as good as it is right now. It will lose some amount of, it will like have more three game matches than two game matches. But it will lose like a little bit of percentage because not that many people are all going to have two Sabo's webs. If Sabo's web, however, becomes the equivalent of Naturalize. Naturalize is a card that is played in a mono red creature deck. Uh, it is played as a two of or even three of in a black green creature deck, right? It is played as redundant copies to disenchant in Bant and green white control decks. Um, but if, if Sabo's web becomes like Naturalize, and people start playing three or even four copies in general, the deck will be unplayable. And the yeah, problem but is, I don't think you can afford it, to play three to four Sabo was on your sideboard. First of all, Sabo's web has the magical text of draw a card on it, and second of all, you can't outvalue Sabo's web because the answers are all one for ones, which means they're zero for ones, and every Sabo's web is like a six for one. Yeah, I, so I I agree, Mike, but I'm just saying that in general, like you're seeding too many points, like. So, you know, for example, um, one goblins is not going to enjoy playing Sabo's web because it has its own wasteland and, and port. Um, uh, obviously it's worth it. Like, you know, the, the price is worth it against oath but, um, uh, but you know, it, you just imagine like goblin sideboard is like pretty tight. Like burn sideboard is like pretty tight. Like elves has so, a really tight sideboard. So four slots no, is not a, huge, a tight sideboard. Oh, this is a tight sideboard. A hundred percent has room for Sabo. You have to run. Well, you would have to choose between Sabo's web or Tempting Worm. Is your sideboard so, going to be four Tempting Worm, four Sabo's web, three Tormod's so crypt? It depends. I was going to play like the Mengu style, the Mengu style mid range elves deck. That deck actually has a lot. It has its sideboard is just full of of anti beatdown. But if you just play the deck that people have been playing in New York, which is the deck that that I played uh, before Sacred Torch and then Ryan Fisher played a version of it to, to top eight. That deck is an incredibly loose sideboard. Like people have like room for. Yes, I agree that the sideboard. I agree that the right, sideboard like, that you built for Ryan Fisher was super loose, but I no, no, think no, that like, it's just it's just loose. Like it, there's just you could just put a lot of things in it, right? Like not because no, that deck. Just tell the, me, just it, tell me the 15 cards you would put, including four Sabo's web in the elf sideboard. It, and I'll it, I'll it, punch it, a bunch of like tier one deck sized hole in that sideboard no no if you're if you're the mid-range deck like the mangu style that is a very tight sideboard you can't replace wall of blossoms with sabo's web right like that's not and that's, that's a huge problem did that deck have wires a, what no did, that doesn't have wires. yeah so it's, that's a huge it's just all creatures and it's and a, yeah. and uh and a, and a tranquil domain so that's a, that's a huge problem because wires is like one big way that elves is able to be 12 12 but 
the but if you're but if you're the natural order style, that deck has tons of room because it it has it has so much tutoring. You could you the cards that matter in your sideboard are like one goblin sharpshooter and a phantom Neshoba, your extra copies of of natural order and that's it. Everything else is flex. Right? So if you I mean Yeah, but you can't you, you can't cover like some stuff. some maniac you might can. some maniac might have to might might be bringing a uh, graveyard based combo deck in which you need Tormont script. Some some maniac might be yeah, playing so burn, I, in which case you, you you might need tempting worm. Some maniac might be playing Oath Pelouche, in which case you need four Sabo's Web. I'm telling you that Despite the fact that you have built loose elves sideboards in the past, you're giving something up. You're giving up coverage against important decks to bring in four Salvos webs. That's why I'm telling you that, like, I don't think that many decks can af afford to play three or four in their sideboard because, like, uh, all these decks that we've built try to use all 15 cards in their sideboard pretty efficiently. Yeah, all, all I'm saying is, well, I'll, I hate to use analogies, so I'll just use a different deck, which is not exactly an analogy. I did a statistical analysis of um, of uh, I can't I think it was legacy top eights and the, the uh, legacy top eights for like a year right and basically what happens is if there are an average of eight or more graveyard hate cards inside boards like Tormod's crypts fairy macabs like whatever it, you know, uh, whatever the one is that like a uh, uh, surgical extraction, if there's an average of eight or more, then dredge decks never win. If there is yeah. an average of if it's any eight? number below eight, dredge decks always finish first. So, <laughs> so like the, that's crazy, right? Like if the, the average is like an average of eight is different than one guy had eight, right? You need everybody else in the top eight to have like eight sideboard cards, and then the dredge deck doesn't get out of the quarters. But if the average is under eight, they always finish first. By dredge, I mean also like uh, breakfast decks, uh, dredge bear. You know, there's different kinds of. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what year this was, but uh, it was like a uh, around it was a uh, around 2014 or something. Um, but oh, that's like ten years ago. But. Uh, uh, that, that's kind of what I'm saying. So the point like, that you're you making is you that beat the deck, you I've, can. I've already started with eight eight of my sideboard cards, and now I only have seven left for non dredge. Is that is that? Yeah. And we're all playing eleven card sideboard now. Actually, we're we're all playing seven card seven sideboards card because cards. we have you, four Ray of Revelation, four Sabo's Web. We can't play a deck that's not white green <laughs> in order to be Oath Pollution. Well, I don't think that you would need the Ray of Revelations anymore if you had the Sabos. Every Sabos so web we're is like a four Sabos web and four Enlightened Tutor, <laughs> so that we can get the Sabos web. But think about it you get you get value like Sabos web's quite good against land still. It's good against um, people would just stop playing land still. They they they're already getting bullied out of the format by just not being a very good deck. And then like just imagine you're just like oh you know. I'm feeling like land still. Maybe it's time. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go sleeve it up. <laughs> see what's going on. In, yeah, <laughs> some pre-modern. You're like, I haven't seen pre-modern. The last time I played pre-modern, Brian Selden won uh, NA champs with uh, this land still deck. It's pretty good against those land tax decks. I wonder if those decks are still around. I'm gonna play a land still. Turn two main deck because everyone's playing Oath Flu. So it's like main deck turn two Sabo's web. And then they're just like, okay, I'm going to go home. My first, <laughs> my first turn fairy conclave is never going to untap this game. Yeah. I'm going to go home, guys. Um, uh, I'm glad after I ranted against Landstill that um, two copies of Landstill uh, showed up in the top eight of the online challenge and one copy made it to the finals of the Awister event. Um, so shout out to all of you fighting the good fight. Um, I'm rooting for you despite... Um, the fact that your deck can't beat Red Green Oath Plush. <laughs> so, well, so why why is Land still incapable of beating Red Green Oath Plush, but it was incapable of losing to Green White Oath Plush? I have no clue. Honestly, I have no clue. Probably because, is it because Thermocarst probably because is still overpowered. It's because Thermocarst because Catac like you you're going all in on your Cataclysm, and if it gets countered, you're like way worse. But like you're not going all in when you therm Thermocarst, and your like land still opponent is just like, oh, I kind of have to counter this Thermocarst. It's like, okay, well, what about yeah. this Thermocarst? It's like, what about this Thermocarst? I have eight so, Thermocarsts. The the other card I think that is good that I will leak is Divert, uh, because I think Divert is actually has text against Counterspell decks, and then um, 
uh, you know, it's obviously it's like the first time you divert a thermocarst. Does your opponent ever cast another thermocarst? Yeah, <laughs> like that's really well. They, they cast it with two mana up. Um, for those uh, that don't know, divert is just misdirection. It costs one U, but it's like misdirection mashed with quench. So it's like one U misdirect unless your opponent plays pays two. Um, in recent action, uh, Paul Master was playing up against TV Tyrant. Paul Master was playing blue white dreadnought with one copy of divert he drew the divert and waited like 30 turns to divert and naturalize like that's like that's how long it took for him to Did stick the divert uh he won a game that he was just gonna lose but um tv tyrant decided to concede because he like like what happened was tv tyrant like ports Paul Master twice and then realizes he can't cast his own Terravore under like the sphere of resistance that he has. So he just concedes because he was like unhappy that he messed one turn up. But like Paul Master was just like way, way, way behind and, um, you know, basically had that game handed to him and it was like a game three. But it, my point is the divert did not do anything for Paul. Like it was, it was not a winning play. I think divert is going to be sick if you can, um, land it against um a thermocarst i think it's any deck i think it's like sick and hilarious yeah it's probably good like the problem probably good against red it's probably good it's hilarious against red uh because you can divert a pyroblast that's targeting a meddling oh, okay it doesn't really work so okay <clears throat> if i was playing Grotog, no, but you could divert you could divert like an incinerate onto a jackal pup How i mean that's great is that that's hilarious but um it's not hilarious it's brutal that's that's abusive yeah i mean it might not even win you the game though <laughs> like but regardless divert is is a pretty fun sideboard card and yeah i think i think a blue deck can can easily play divert like you know some copies of divert um they probably still want sabos but like i hate i hate like divert's a two for one but like i hate these like um you know incremental sideboard cards like hydroblast it's like chill is so much better than hydroblast right because chill just hydroblasts like 10 spells instead of one well it depends i think divert is obviously very bad in land still right land still is a deck that wants to play like 20 turns yeah so the opponent's likely to have two mana open but decks that are like trying to play four turns divert's probably great you know like because the games are so short yeah but decks trying to play four turns are like already really good against stone rain like that's like the fundamental weakness of like the fundamental weakness of the red green oath blue deck which is actually shored up by pyroclasm is just that like okay like i all i need to do is have naturalized for your oath of druids and then my creature deck just gets to like you know do things like if i'm playing savannah lions like um you know mother of runes uh savannah lions meddling mage i'm like i have like meddling mage on pyroclasm and i have ray of revelation in my range or i just have a disenchant like i'm probably going to get you before you find your second oath of druids I mean, when you just describe this, like, I just, everything can go wrong for that deck, right? Like, everything can go wrong. I mean, it just depends. Like, if you're over, if you're good at beating decks that are good, then that's still, like, a good thing. Like, if you like, because the thing about Goblins and Elves is, like, you can't disenchant a Pyroclasm. And, like, Pyroclasm is just going to get you really, really hard um, if you're pinched yeah. between both Pyroclasm and Oath of Druids. So, I... Uh, maybe I'm going to change my mind about something right now, which is that, you know, like, are we now of the opinion that decks that are good against th good decks are good? Um, like Rifter is just the best against, against like a lot of the good decks. It just was horrible against Armageddon and, you know, not particularly good against. Well, I got bad like, news about, like, I got bad news about the blue white 12, 12 sideboard for you. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I guess you get game one. No, maybe you just slow play them. You can beat twelve threat. You can beat eight threats, right? I don't know. I'd have to think about this because like, no, you get you just get dazed out. Like after the Armageddon, you just get dazed out. And but then Freyand was just like he never wants to play against Eternal Dragon decks with his with his Pelush variants and uh, and like you know, Rifter just like it's so good against goblins, it's so good against elves, so good against land still, so good against red. Like it's the best deck against a lot of those decks, and it was just really horribly bad against some decks. Well, it sounds uh, like Rifter is like really bad against Oath Pollution, and it ha and and it also doesn't no, like no. playing Sabo's Web because it has Dust Bowl and eight Cycling Lands. 
well, just don't play the cycling lands. Just cycle the cycling lands. Sometimes you have to play the cycling lands so you can you cast do. your Sabo's web. <laughs> what happens if you open your hand and it's like secluded step mountain Sabo's web? What if it's maybe, secluded maybe. step dust bowl Sabo's web? Are you shipping? <laughs> I don't think I would play Sabo's web in Rifter. I don't think it's bad against red green oath pollution. Frianna doesn't like to well, play. Well, what's hilarious the is like if, if I if I just if I just added Sabo's web to the metagame, your Rifter deck is like hilariously like owned by that. It, it it takes a little splash damage, but it's not. The deck has like a ton of plains and mountains. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's not like yeah. Obviously, like, a, it Eternal would be Dragon annoying, is annoying. Yeah, but it's not like. It's, it's, it's like, like an, it's still pretty sick because it's every it's, it's all like, of them. Yeah, so like it's like getting plow wondered, but the plow wonder costs one Just mana and draws a card. Right? Like <laughs> no, 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 that I I I factored all that. Oh yeah, yeah it yeah, costs yeah, yeah. one mana. One mana like, plow. A wonder. One mana yeah. plow wonder is probably the best card. Anyway, you hate <laughs> analogies, but I hate we'll call Sabo's web a one mana plow wonder. One mana plow. I don't know, Mike. You can you can play Rifter. You can bring back Rifter. You can make Rifter fetch. Um. You know, I took Rifter apart fourteen different deck w- deck ways. It doesn't well. even have its own red blasts anymore. Oh well, I don't know. That just means you have to head back over to Cool Stuff Inc. and enter in promo code for us for five percent off your whole order. No, I own the whole deck. I would just put the cards back in. Well, you need duplicates. You need dupes so you can keep everything together for the gauntlet. That is true. I didn't realize I could just put the crappy printings of cards into decks, and then I wouldn't have to keep taking them apart. I realized that recently when we did the episode with Caffeinated. The Caffeinated was just like, I hate land still so much, so I put like all the white bordered cards. Yeah, yeah. He I just keeps just, the new bordered, white bordered stuff in his I was just like, like, oh my gosh, all those new bordered flooded strands are just sitting in the box. <laughs> that was my. Yeah. <laughs> just never go in any decks. Yeah. I have 12 meddling mages, and four of them are new bordered. So after I have two meddling mage decks assembled, I can make a third one with new bordered. Like, that's what happened when I loaned cards to Etai. Like, I loaned the blue white deck to Etai, and I was like, man, I'm not going to make Etai play these new bordered meddling mages. So then I bought four <laughs> more old bordered meddling mages. <laughs> like, he wouldn't have known the difference. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, he probably had an easier time reading the uh, new bordered ones, but um, I'm not going to slander. Uh, peculiar like that um but uh yeah i mean i think that uh, uh, all in all right um in order for our podcast to like be helpful helpful to the masses like before this before like literally this month and last month before uh january 20th when um fran unleashed oath pollution onto the world burn was winning everything Burn won Hartford. We like hadn't even. We completely forgot to mention that Burn won Hartford um, in the hands of Bryn Pitt um, again from the Worcester crew, and Burn was just tearing up. And Burn still has the most tops on TC decks right now. Um, so Burn, I, Burn won. Burn won in the hands of Jared, and then it also won the most impressive of all of the tournaments, the Thursday meetup before the thousand dollar tournament. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, volleyball. It also uh, happened to win a volleyball. Yeah. So burn was everywhere. So um, uh, I guess if you are a burn person, you're going to really need to uh, slip slip into Mike's DMs, send him some VODs of you playing against your friend on Red Green Oath Blush. Mike can tell you everything that he's doing wrong. And you can solve what is going to be the most important matchup of our time, Red Green Oath Blush versus burn. And then if you're worried about those two decks... You should probably just play Blue White Dreadnought because it beats both of them. <laughs> just does Blue White? Did we decide Blue White Dreadnought just beats Red Green? It's like good against Red Green because like Red Green I'll just take, doesn't have plowshares. Good against like how do you how do you feel like uh, do you think Green Blue Squirrelop is good against Red Green or you think it's horrible? I don't think it's good against Red Green. But let me pitch something to you. My deck has basic island and land of war elves. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Come on. Uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think it beats um, the the deck that has oath and pyroclasm and sea resistance. Uh, you can conceivably fight against sphere because your deck is also thirty mana sources. But then does tapping sphere do anything? No, it's not a mono artifact. <laughs> It's a continuous artifact. Or maybe it's the other way around. Continuous artifacts don't work when they're tapped. 
what was what was no no was mono artifact or? so so uh icy manipulator is a mono artifact, okay okay right? so that's tap to activate didn't they didn't tap no no they didn't use to tap <laughs> Right, right, right. You just use them once a turn. That's why okay, it's so, called a mono artifact. So continuous artifacts get turned off by being tapped. Um, and then yeah. it's just an artifact. <laughs> it's the third kind. So I think all artifacts used to get turned off by being tapped, and then they just changed the text on some of them. Yeah, all conti- like continuous. Well, all, all yeah, artifacts were either good. continuous or mono artifacts, and then it... I think so. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think mono artifacts didn't actually tap yet. It was like you know before the laws of physics yeah you just you just like solidified. your opponent was just like well you've used that this turn so that, i believe that <laughs> so you can't use it, it was, again how it was litigated oh uh, man let's for old time's sake i'm going to pull up the original text on ice manipulator to just try to imagine what things must have been alpha. like must have been like one colon you may tap any land creature or artifact in play on either side yeah, I don't know who who read the rules. Somebody was just like sinking all their mana into this, and they're just like, "Man, this card's broken." <laughs> oh, that would be that would be good. That would be like even better than Mistress Helix. But that was a mono artifact. Uh, fair enough. Um, so I'm gonna play a deck that is four misdirection, four Teferi's response, four Sabo's web. Do you think I could lose to Red Green Oak? Probably still could lose, but. Yeah, I mean, I can if I get this fear resistance down, and I just like have a red blast. Maybe I could like, well, my red blast would cost two mana. No, you probably can't lose from that spot. What if you don't have anything left in your deck, and instead of casting spells, I just attack with Treetop Village? You can't misdirect a Terravor. <laughs> like, my deck has four Snobos Web. Oh, sorry, sorry. You can't misdirect a Terravor. What if I just play Terravor? What if I wasteland my own oh, tapped one, land? One Terravore. Okay, two, two Terravore. I'm not losing it. What if I have like Waterfront Bouncer? What are you going to do about that? Okay, well, you added Waterfront. Water now I can't beat it. Now I can't beat Waterfront Bouncer. Yeah. The Waterfront Bouncer was a was a bridge too far. You, that was it. That yeah. was the straw. That, the, 20th, that broke, the 20th card. That broke yeah. the Terravore's back. Um, We wanted to talk a little bit about going all in, but I don't... Going all in. Yeah. But... um. I don't know. Like I don't know. I don't know how to flesh out this concept, but I guess I'll start by uh, reminding listeners um, about our episode with Sam Black, in which Sam Black found that um, opponents would take advantage of spots where they could go all in with thirty five percent equity, and that was their only way of beating Sam Black. Because if they play on, um, they they have zero percent chance of winning against Sam Black at Dreamblade, um, and I thought this was really interesting um, because the best analogy I had for this with poker is that um, you can go all in in a cash game and uh, you, you you can go all in with fifty one percent equity or just like just a little bit of edge, right? And if you do that every amount of time for roughly the same amount of money, obviously there's a bunch of factors, but let's just oversimplify. You can always make a hundred dollar bet on. 55 percent and if you can make that bet all the time you always be ahead right um you can always rebuy 100 and take your shot at making the next bet that bet again but if you're playing in a poker tournament you can only go all in once ignoring rebuys you can only go in all in once and then all of a sudden going all in on 55 percent is not very good if your expectation is that playing on gives you more equity um so when that applies to magic, that kind of seeds back into a lot of what we talked about, about more conservative play, playing to play more turns um, and that kind of stuff. And uh, I thought it was it's interesting to think about because it effectively um, it really is a, a sort of corollary to the Reed Duke Bloodthirst article, which is just that, like, you should go all in on 6040 against Huey and LSV and you should just call 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 them down if um they're a player that you perceive to be worse than you. It's like a mortal. Yeah, I against mean, a mere so mortal, I, yeah. I think the what I got out of the conversation we had prior to finally talking about magic theory uh, was that you thought that the secret to how good the gameplay in pre-modern is is the ability to switch gears right sure and which has nothing like, to go nothing to do with shoving <laughs> well i mean i think that you came out of like some decks they just shove 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, but versus other ones can do more than one thing. Right. Okay. Yeah, or great analogy. Gifted. Great analogy for this, which is just that, like, some decks, if their only tactic is to shove, is it, it, uh, like you know, shove when you're good or when you think you're good. The other deck can do everything. They can mulligan. They can, uh, you know, select for you know, select for their importance or whatever. Just like select for their cards that beat your your shove strategy, and that's why. Um, uh, I felt so strongly about uh, Exalted Angel in the sideboard to replenish, for instance, which is just like the the mere existence of Exalted Angel means that uh, a a sharp rich Shea opponent cannot simply just be like, okay, well, I'm planning on just defeating Opalescence and replenish, and you'll never win, right? I'm um, only going to focus on this one brick in your wall, exactly. But if I hit that brick, the whole the whole thing city's going to fall, yeah. you know. Um, and uh. Uh, Angry Hermit kind of does that too. Um, Swords of Postures obviously fully covers the Angry Hermit deck. Um, and uh, yeah, you uh, at the end of the day, that was the problem that we had with Mono Blue Dreadnought, right? Which is just that Mono Blue only has the plan of putting Phyrexian and Dreadnought into play, and then it can pivot like the brain, the brain freeze pivot became the a, a small way for uh the mono blue to experience a little bit of a renaissance um the brain freeze tech has obviously been around but um you know i think it's becoming more and more crucial in the minds of the mono blue players i think uh having four powder kegs has been super important for the mono blue deck to conceivably play as a control deck um and then obviously people get fancy with parallax tide uh mish's factory etc cetera, etc cetera. so they're trying to add gears to a deck that before this didn't have those gears um and i had the same thought when it came to this problem that i had with landstill which is just that um like landstill always plays in gear three uh like this inevitability game right like landstill effectively never <laughs> assumes the beat down with few exceptions yeah, landstill plays like a gear two game where they just suppress the opponent's stuff it's different though. Like instead of like using your spells to kill their stuff while attacking with a jackal pup, you're just like cycling through stuff with standstills to keep your to keep your attrition engine. It's going. it's just like very predictable to interact with. And like um, you know, when I was playing like the, the replenish deck, um, I was like, okay, my strategy is like very straightforward. Like the landstill deck is like effectively never gonna kill me. So I'm just gonna cast deep analysis and flash it back and then I will have four cards to their one and like I will just cast all my spells and all of them have to be countered and like um, a landstill deck that doesn't have access to tide combo is never going to be able to have a say in what I'm doing right they have to respond to everything and really? the only cards <clears throat> that matter are parallax tide opalescence and replenish parallax tide opalescence replenish um, exalted angel and you draw plenty like that's uh oh, oh it's also changed after sideboarding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, this is like sideboarding. Like you but lose like you lose one, game one a lot. You just lose game one a lot because you have a tunement in your deck, and attunement's like really, really bad against well, Lance. You deck. have you actually have more must counters in your deck than they have counter spells. Yeah. By a by but a lot. Like, and you draw a but, lot of them. But I'm just saying, like, you don't they don't actually have to answer a lot of these cards. Like they Um, yeah, I mean basically you end up being you like you're just more dense right because you cast intuition for three deep analysis and then then you're just playing a threat every single turn like it just doesn't matter what or it is. or if you were really good at it you could just side in thawing glaciers and you could you could do the thawing glaciers thing to them yeah and it also you have a bands remember so like that adds four more uh, must I, counters i, I, well. I do yeah. remember yeah. i once said can i just cantrip they're like sure i'm like cool man uh, short man short <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Um, so it was great, man. Short. So, uh, replenish after sideboard, uh, is extremely good against landstill, you know, for the, for the reasons like landstill is just going to behave very predictably against replenish. It's going to behave predictably against every deck. Um, like until, um, arcane lab got introduced into the range for, uh, the landstill deck, like the red deck was just like, okay, well dealing circle protection, red Is really predictable. Um, if you want to, you can just flaring pain, but you can also just play, the circle protection game that we've talked about um, ad nauseum. Um, and so Lancel kind of is one of those decks that 
um, because it can't really shift roles or it can't give an opponent a different look. It's like you're playing poker, except for you've got the same hole cards every single time. <laughs> and it's just like, well, I know when to, I know when I have you beat, right? Like, um, and that was the problem with blue, uh, mono blue right now, where it's just like, okay, well, my strategy can simply be meddling mage name, uh, fire exchange right now. And then my life becomes a lot easier than it was before. Um, oh, I mean, in the, <clears throat> like in the original sort of like last March or something, right. Situation where blue, white Argent knot wasn't really known yet. And, um, you know, some people still thought that mono blue dreadnought was the premier dreadnought deck. Like there was just, w what was the out, right? You could reality ripple the, yeah, you reality rippled or boomerang. Do you have like one boomerang, one reality ripple? Yeah. So like that was not very likely to happen. You're just going to get beat down for two a turn from the meddling mage. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, so uh, I kind of got got to that point because you have been suggesting a combo deck that only has one gear. <laughs> and I'm just like, well, the problem but it is... it has a lot of different turn one, two, three, and four kills. Yeah, but regardless, your opponent... They're all bad just towards your, the plowshares. Your opponent... <laughs> Like, like that, I mean, that was like the whole point. Like, it's just kind of like, you know, what's the, you know, what's great about replenish is just like game one, your opponent's swords of plowshares aren't good. It's like, you know, what's great about post sideboard. It's like their swords of plowshares have to stay in or else their entire, you know, the, or else you get to play exalted angel and then you just get a win that way. Um, you know, and, and obviously if your opponent's whole strategy is like just haunting echoes or just Hormod's crypt or whatever, like you just forced your opponent to be like, okay, how many decks have enchantment removal creature removal grave graveyard removal and then like vol enough volume of that to like beat deep analysis it was just like attacked from so many angles um oh, because your life total is not under pressure yeah exactly it's like once you're like if your opponent has a single meddling mage and they get to cut off one of your gears and they get to clock you then all of a sudden deep analysis flashback deep analysis tap ancient tomb doesn't look good um but uh yeah so i don't know new axiom all pre-modern decks must be able to change gears. Well, that's just not true. I think the pre-modern decks that you like to play tend to have more than one gear. But not they don't all have to change gears, right? Like how many gears does Elves have? Elves has like it has Elves has like a thousand gears. It has uh one one gear, it has uh uh three three for three flashback gear. How many gear. gears does Elves have? It has it have combo gear it have survival. It, I mean, the, the, it has drain Shermie gear and it has elephant gear, it <laughs> and it has one gear. and it has one one gear. It has biorhythm biorhythm gear sometimes. Like, <laughs> I guess I guess no elves has gears, and then like the sideboard, you know, the mangu. No, no elves has. exists because of the need for more gears. Like. Uh, everyone who plays natural order elves is like, well, the problem was if I didn't have survival, like I had nothing. So I just like added natural order so I could just have but the more dissatisfaction things. I have with that version. And I was one of the, you know, obviously Damien had it first. Right. But like, I was like one of the people who was like, oh, this is a pretty good innovation in elves. Is that like you would land a fast phantom to Shoba or Verdant force or both with haste. And it just and wasn't still enough. lose to goblins. Right. Like, uh, there was a, I was watching a match this week um, where one player had like a natural order of survival of the fittest and the other player was Mike Hoip and Mike Hoip just uh, beat beat a Phantom Mishoba that had hit him twice already uh, from basically nothing Yeah, uh, with a Goblin Sharpshooter and like he played his matron really well I would have probably got like a different different Goblin I also think I would have taken less damage than he did early, but he he literally just ate two hits from the Phantom to show, but yeah. set up an inevitable board state. Yeah, well, and yeah, then he just like lit his opponent up because he had Skirk Prospector, a double pile driver attack, and then Siege Gang Commander. So every goblin converted for a damage or like one point three damage or something something silly like that. When he he had two life, went down to one life from a Carpoozin Forest tap. Did 36 points of damage to his opponent and killed all of his opponent's creatures in one turn. Yeah. Um, so I guess that the goblin stack has more than one gear. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say so too. So 
uh, I mean, all the good decks have uh, multiple gears. In fact, the one deck that maybe has the fewest gears out of tier one decks right now is Red Green Oath Plush <laughs> because it has, it can't shift away from Stone Rain gear if it only no, draws we, Stone Rain. I, I disagree. Like Red Green Oath Plush is like three or four different decks. Depend. That's the thing I like, hate about like these decks that don't have a you know quote unquote like a lot of agency or they have like a lot of clunky cards they're like a different deck depending on what game you're playing. yeah 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 sometimes right, like, sometimes you draw spheres and, and sometimes you draw oath of druids I mean, and like, it's just like those are two very different cards there are some games where your opponent goes first turn land war elves go right and you're just like land mox oath that is a different deck than this plotting deck that is just like i am going to cast a winter's grasp yeah. What the thought? I am going to tap one of your lands on upkeep and hope you don't have a key instant for me. Yeah, I mean, right? like, I mean, the deck, the deck, uh, uh, is very bad into days and gush because it can't afford to board out eight stone rings. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying, but it, but that deck that is just like I'm going to play a first turn oath of druids is a different deck. It it plays out like a different deck than like the stone rain deck and like. The decks where the the games where sphere of resistance comes out early and grossly disrupts an opponent's ability to build momentum is it, again that's a completely different deck and it and it, it's weird where you're just like I'm just gonna pay five for my thermocarst and that's <laughs> that's okay <laughs> like yeah I mean I know. I I think it's I think the the angle that I'm, I'm mostly thinking of just like if you want to like beat the deck with your deck um you know every deck gets to half sabo's web and like you know the, the mana base is so core to the you know they can't board out their treetop village you know treetop village mishes factory uh wasteland and ports so like you just kind of get them oh, and but just so of oh, something you were saying earlier i think goblins can play sabo's web if they just switch from Rishid on port to wasteland, the downside on Sabo is that it becomes very small. Yeah, it becomes right? much smaller. Because you sure. never have to untap the wasteland. Yeah. So, like, you know, all the people who argue about wasteland versus Mistress Factory, I think if the universe moves to Sabo's web, wasteland's going to get a lot better. Yeah, you mean wasteland uh, versus Mistress Factory? Yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, port, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's true, but also port is so good in Goblins. <laughs> it's like. Yeah, but I think I, it's like I so disagree. it's so good just because of Dreadnought like uh, you know if you watched Michael Hoyp's games against Dreadnought like uh, being able to go lackey and deport you um, is just huge uh, uh, a huge way to steal game one uh, I, Dreadnought. I have a lot less experience playing with port and goblins than I have playing wasteland and goblins and I played a lot of wasteland and goblins and I can tell you I have never been dissatisfied with wasteland and you know, I all the time Francis is like, this is yet another example of when port is better than wasteland. But he's never looking for examples where wasteland is better than port, right? He's decided he and Tom think that R Richard on port is better. So they just like point out all the times that Richard on port was better. But there's just I don't know. I never I was never unhappy playing wasteland. And it always felt impressive to me. That's that is my opinion on the card. And I, I could be wrong. I, I I could see maybe Richard on port is better in the abstract. But if the universe shifts a little bit in this direction, I think Wasteland will objectively become better. Uh, also because Goblins itself will play will play Sabo's Web, potentially. But more importantly, man, Lackey Wasteland's pretty hard to beat. Yeah, but Lackey Port is better if your opponent only has Basic Island. Um, and especially if they're the presenting 12-12, phase out 12-12. The following turn. You're the one who always says to me that Goblins has no problems beating 12 12. But that's so. that's a huge way that's a huge way to improve your game one range. So if you're on the plate, so your game one against 12 12 is not very good because your only coverage on turn two 12 12 is being ahead with Tinker like somehow well, or your deck or has me in deck natural. Lines. Yeah, but it, it's two or three and you also have to string it together with a green source. So it's like so much more compelling to be able to go lackey port and then um, put your opponent one turn. It's like all you need is one turn. So I actually lost yeah, a game. Obviously, you drop a siege gang commander on turn two. Yeah, but that's what happened. That's what happened for Hoyp. Like, like that's that's a that's the way Hoyp stole game one, and um, it happened on camera when when uh, Tom and I tested, where I got greedy and I went 
uh, lackey and I had the port, but I just played a pile driver instead. And then um, uh, Tom had uh, foil for the pile driver and then played 12 12. Um, so if I just like had not played pile driver and just like went lackey siege gang and then lackey uh, lackey in the pile driver while porting, uh, Tom would be one one turn behind on the dreadnought and just wouldn't have been able to come back. And you, stealing game one for goblins is like a big deal. You physically own a blue white twelve twelve dreadnought deck. Right? Yeah, what, which physically. one did you think I gave Etai? <laughs> what cards do you? But think you've I gave never him? played the deck yourself in a tournament that mattered to you, right? Uh, no. That's weird to me. I also own one, and I've never you've played never played. Yeah, you never. Played I've it. never played it. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I played. I, I don't played think that it's. Day. I don't think that it's fun. Like, I just don't really like, like, it's, it just feels like you're solving the same puzzle every game. And it's just kind of like, it just feels like going through the motions. And I just like value my pre-modern time, um, a lot more like, you know, you, you don't have to play pre-modern, you get to play pre-modern. Right. And it's just like, okay, well, what am I going to do with this time? Like, am I going to play, like, am I going to solve the same puzzle and over, over, like, you know, if you love the puzzle, like you playing burn, then that's great. Right. But like. Otherwise, um, you know, I is the place so different with Groatog versus twelve. Yeah, it's it's huge because you're like your valuations on everything like don't get reduced to like how do I gush oh, I foil? Right? You're playing Storm instead of Splinter Twin, right? Yeah, something. Yeah, that's a, something like that. It's yeah. a close enough comparison. Like Splinter Twin's a great example, right? Splinter Twin is just super. I mean, I never played Splinter Twin because um, I was on, you know, hiatus. Um, but like, I have to imagine the like blue red deck with cantrips. Um, you know, that was like putting together this combo that could be played at instant speed on your end step. Uh, you know, or at least half played at instant well, speed on your end step was just like not like interesting gameplay. You know, I, I felt it like it was incredibly interesting when I invented it, but like I did all kinds of cool stuff, right? Like one of the things that was fun about it was the planeswalker rules were different back then. So I was smart and I played Jace Bellerin in my deck to get under my opponent's Jace the Mind Sculptor. That was a thing that I did. Like that was like a sub game I played. Um, there was a lot of stuff you did, like you played uh, Deceiver Exarch to like, you know, start a fight that your opponent was inevitably going to lose on their end step. And then maybe you just played your Jason the Mind Sculptor and then beat them that way. Uh, but, you know, I, I made top 8 or top 16, I think, in that first 5K I won with Splinter Twin by putting uh, a Splinter Twin on a, I think it's called Mog Vandal, Manic Vandal. He's a, the red Uktabi orangutan. And I just smashed all of my opponent's artifacts. I, like, like, I smashed his... Spell Skite, I smashed all of his equipment because he was playing Cawblade. It was sick, right? Like, isn't that cool? How cool is that? I mean, I don't know. Right? I have no frame of reference. Like, I don't know what else I could have been doing at the time, but... And the, the, oh, every every good player played Cawblade. That was the thing. Every good player played Cawblade. There were, like, 12 Cawblades in the top 16. Um, and I, I don't know. I beat, like, nine Cawblade players that day. Uh, but, I don't know. I just wanted to play my own deck. And it turned out my deck was good, and then they banned it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I basically just like I don't know. I just it it's also just like not like I I think it's it's also I I, I guess I'll put it like on another thing like playing blue white twelve toes is actually like kind of stressful sometimes because you're just like um always have to you know you you always have to like pick your spot. I kind of like understand um from a psychological standpoint why people like adding peak to the deck because they're just like you know, <laughs> you know i'm done with these I, I calculations had... i'm just gonna i'm just gonna take a look and decide <laughs> like, the first time i played 12 12 but it was mono blue 12 12 i played peak yeah i thought i, mean, I think that, i mean that i think that the the information is not like zero i just think the cantrip is so bad when like you know you need to hit a land on time like you know ops being twice as good as as peak when you're looking for I mean, specifically like a daze or an island peak like meddling mage is a pretty obvious combo right like it, yeah but it's like it's like peak look at your hand and be like oh, okay well i'm gonna name plowshares even though it's not in your hand because you have white man on play that's just like not that's like not really a combo 
like um, peak I and then agree. choose between jamming meddling mage or combo that's more interesting right if you go turn one peak turn two jam like that's better than turn one peak turn two meddling mage um and then turn three jam except for like now turn three is too slow because maybe your opponent like is a combo to, i mean i don't know it's actually really hard to imagine losing turn two meddling mage turn three jam but you can do it and the peak won't help you um but uh, maybe it'll help me maybe i drew into a foil yeah right well then the opt would uh the opt would be twice as good as drawing the foil um but yeah um i think that uh i'm i would be like down to play blue white dreadnought but i have i also have the same thing as you where i'm just like um you know what what happens if my opponent plays fear resistance and and like they just get it through (laughs) i'm just like then life becomes hard i mean you just disenchant it Sphere of Resistance is just as bad for Growatog. It's even worse, maybe. It's like kind of worse because Growatog plays like twelve cantrips, and Dreadnought only plays eight. So yeah, but the when I would evaluate these two decks, like one of them, like let's say I just play like a first or second turn Curian Dryad with the Days in my hand, a red red removal deck cannot kill my Curian Dryad versus. They yeah. can just naturalize a 12 12. Yeah, yeah, it's really or good. They, they can pyroblast a psychotog. But, like, I literally just cast a dry, even if my cantrips cost two, uh, once it's 4 4, they're fucking dead. Yeah, yeah, it's right? really, like, it's, the, it's very good in, in, like, Curian Dryad is a good card against, um, like, Oath Pollution General, uh, for, for that reason. And, right. like, Grotog is better against the deck because Grotog gets to play Ray of Revelation. But the card Sphere Resistance alone is more annoying for Grotog uh, than it is for Dreadnought because, like, you know, Dreadnought can just play through the Sphere. Um, they just, like, get Gush cut off a little bit, but they can just play through the Sphere. They'll just combo for four mana. It's phased out, right? And then it untaps and it casts Counterspell for three mana. And then it's in, right? Or like in some of the games we were testing, just like Vision Charm and the Sphere. At the end. Yeah, Vision Charm and the Sphere, if you have to. You know, but you can also vision charm the dreadnought and then vision charm the dreadnought again. Like, um, you can, uh, yeah, but I, I'm just you have just disenchant, like, you know, too. So you can just like play disenchant for three mana. <laughs> so, so it's like about like problem solving, you know, it, it's weird because no one's ever really beating Superman if Superman wants to win, you know, like, but like in all the comic book stories, like people just figure out a way to like hit him with a magic lightning bolt or like, you know, get some crypt get some kryptonite chewing gum or something. Like, yeah. They're always just like, whoo, 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 get to kryptonite, right? And then you have like these weird spots where you like sub in Captain Marvel or you sub in somebody. Like Martian Manhunter is a bad example because he's like vulnerable to fire, right? Like, so he's like vulnerable to fire in the same way that Superman is vulnerable to kryptonite, right? But you just like literally sub in some other people who are like Superman level superheroes. And there's just, there's no kryptonite. There's no fire. There's no radium for them, right? Like, they're just like, well, how do I win this spot? Like, you don't. But the reality is, no one was ever really beating Superman. He like, let you get the, he let you get the kryptonite chewing gum spot. That's the only way it would work because he could, he could kill you from space, right? Well, meddling mage just, is good as super is good against it. Like, you just meddling mage naming Superman, and then what's he gonna do? You can't get him on the battle. You <laughs> can't get him down. <laughs> like, He's like, like. Uh, okay, so what would you argue is the current pre-modern equilibrium metagame? What deck is beating what deck beating what deck? Uh, I think well, the equilibrium metagame, you mean like how many players are, I, I just just bear with me for a sec. How many players are we talking about in, in this, this conjectural event and what are their motivations is the first question I would ask. Well, I'm, I I don't want to say like a hypothetical event. I'm actually just saying like um you know uh like we have like this blue white dreadnought deck right and like it's getting played at like sub ten percent. Okay, that's wrong. All right, so uh, let, let me just tell you like another meta game right. So, uh, Mirrodin block constructed after the banning of Skull Clamp, um, had about a seventy five percent affinity ratio right at least at the at competitive tables right day two's top tables that was too low right so the win rate of affinity was such that even if you were playing an anti-affinity deck it was 
it should have been more than 75% of the metagame. It's probably about like 86% of the metagame. Right. Despite the fact that there were green, blue, red, green, and even blue, white decks that were, that were lined up to beat it. Right. If you look at onslaught block constructed, right? Like the metagame is mostly like, you know, 40% goblins, 40% red, white variants, and then like fringe decks that actually could beat both of them, but, you know, had had some structural problems. Like, Beast Bidding, for example, was never going to lose to Red White. Uh, ever. Uh, but, you know, Beast Bidding wasn't popular, and Red White was extremely popular. Um, so, if, if I were to, like, look at a 100-player tournament, right? 10 Blue-White Dreadnought players is far too few. Right? Like, a 100-player tournament, you're probably looking at, like, I don't know. If, and everybody wants to win. Well, I'm just saying, like, what decks like are beating what decks. I'm like literally just saying, and it's like goblins is beating blue white dreadnought. Blue white dreadnought is beating, I guess, red green oath pollution. Um, we've yet that to it's barely beating red green oath pollution. That's the thing, right? So I mean, Fran I Fran added beating. one crumble to his sideboard. So <laughs> so I think that it's beating it, but I don't think it's beating it by a crazy percentage. Like. The, I don't want to play blue white dreadnought because I don't want to lose to some idiots. Yeah, yeah, resistance. yeah. I mean, you've mentioned that's that. how I emotion. But you can still, but you can actually situation. still beat it, like as we discussed. Right? Yeah, I just don't want to be in the. Sp- I just don't want to be in the spot, right? Like, I'd much rather be a red deck that's like fighting up against twelve twelves all day than ever lose to somebody. Sphere. I mean, it's actually I feel like it's actually kind of great for the dreadnought player because, like, your disenchant go like. You know, the red green player has to keep a, keep every hand, right? The red green player has to keep like every seven, and is like relying really hard on sphere resistance and four naturalize and and some amount of blasts, right? That's a very very small range for you to have covered by just like disenchanting, you know, like one disenchant to cover sphere, and then you just you, you probably just need one counter spell, so you just need one vision charm, and then you're there. Just like really, really small hurdle to cross. And then you can also just get under the sphere of resistance by having um, like if you're on the play, you can just turn turn to combo and then untap and cast counter spell and then, you know, or days. Right. So um, I really like blue white dreadnought into um, oath plush all variants, um, but I think, um, like, but I think like, the white version uh, fixes the matchup a lot better. I think there should be like 35 blue white dreadnought decks out of 100 then. And something like I think there should be 35 goblins players. I mean goblins being I think a, there should a, be about 30 goblins players, right? Uh I think there should be about like 20 red deck players. Uh and then so 60 70 80. I think there'd be about 5 red green oath pollution players, but it's it's a meaningful part of the meta game. Um and then like 15 all other decks something like that right so uh what did i miss that's in tier one else oh there should be if there's 30 goblins players you don't want to be elves if this if this room has 20 red deck players and 30 goblins players you don't want to be elves that day so is elves is not a tier one deck anymore should i downgrade it it's it's it has the highest ceiling it's Mengu went two and one against goblins at, at Italian national. Yeah, but what, at what cost? He gave up anger. I he mean, gave up his entire sideboard. He gave up everything. His sideboard has one just to go tranquil s- just to go sixty six percent. The rest of his sideboard is wall of blossoms, spike feeders, and call of the herd. He's mono anti red beatdown cards in his sideboard, and like not fancy ones like tempting one. Yeah, so he wants to just he just wants to punch and punch. I think I'm hearing that elves is no longer in tier one. It it it's really unimpressive to me when they cast a natural order and lose game one. That is the thing that is I mean like yeah, I, I'm then, Jackal Pup dot deck, you cast natural order and I won. Yeah. Is, and if people that, listen to if, if people listen to Spike Colony podcast and their deck produces black mana, they know exactly what they have to do. Uh yeah, that is also true. Um I mean, luckily, there's no good decks that produce black mana, with maybe the exception of Grow Talk. <laughs> but what about the Rock? I said there's no good deck that produces black <laughs> mana. I don't, I don't, <laughs> don't know what about this premise. You don't understand. The deck has to be uh, good and produce black mana. The Rock is one of those things. <laughs> 
it's very good. Uh, yeah, I guess Engineered Plague is also... I mean, what about the black-white playable Dead Guy Ale control deck? That, that deck, I think, is less horrible now because if people move from red... Uh, green white to red green oath pollution i think like it's quite good against red green and it yeah was it's much better against yeah pollution. yeah absolutely interesting thing so so there's going to be like a sub oath pollution meta game where like on a given day if more people show up with red green so some, some decks are going to be good and some if you show up some more people will show up with the green white because the green white deck is still around like people still play it but the red it's green nice. deck might bully the green white deck out because the red green deck is really good against the green white deck Oh yeah, it's just the same. The mono green deck was great against the green white deck, but the red green deck is like just the mono green deck. With it, it's slightly worse in game one because its mana base is worse, and pyroclasm is not good in this matchup. But I'm bumping. It's basically the mono green deck. I'm bumping elves down to tier two. I'm gonna I'm gonna put it below burn. I, I hate to agree with you. I I think it might. I think you might be right. Because elves, um, what does elves beat anymore? Just like the rock. Like what does it beat any what what deck does elves beat anymore? It beats blue eyed dreadnought sometimes, but if you cut all the the tangle wires, like I don't know. You, I so you just beat bad decks. You enough. only beat bad decks. Uh, it's good against land still. They say, just like with a resolved survival of the fittest that doesn't get removed. But that's the thing. It's like I guess it's just a binary deck. It's just like if you resolve survival of the fittest, then you win, and if you don't. Then you lose. Mike Harris told me that he thought that Feb was grossly favored against Elves. Heads up, and I, I I'm not disagreeing with him. I've never played the matchup, but yeah, Elves just has no weird. resistance, right? Yeah, elves, elves only has faster. naturalize. Elves just wins in the first four turns. I elves, guess. Is, elves are not faster; they're the same speed. It's like whoever has play. Actually, Feb Feb can be faster because Feb can uh, Feb can Feb has more turn threes than Elves. Like elves turn three is the god draw and turn four oh, is the average. I guess you can't stop them from just the hermit combo. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So if you yeah. just like turn one or turn two hermit, like you're you get them right. Um, but both 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 decks are gold goldfish to turn four, and I think hermit feb just has more turn threes because of hermit. Maybe my deck isn't that good because even though it has a lot of turn ones, like elves is just a turn four deck also, and I could just play elves and elves has like. 47 other gears yeah but it doesn't all involve but it doesn't survive but it doesn't beat goblins so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um okay because elves doesn't beat uh elves doesn't like really beat burn it can if it wants to it never beats goblins um except for you know if you devote 14 of 15 Mangu devoted 14 of his yeah. sideboard cards 14 of 15 sideboard cards it doesn't look good against red green oath pollution it doesn't look it's better against I, that's, green white. that's i lost um but yeah, it gets uh, you know, it gets pyroclasms pretty hard. It doesn't uh, beat Enchantress the... allegedly. Elves, I think elves is favored against Enchantress. I mean, it just depends on who you ask. Uh, I played Cam with elves. That's why I think that it beats Enchantress. Um, so tier one just becomes Goblins, Oath Plush, and and Dreadnought, and then that tier and one. Red. But only for you. Like I'm trying to make this document useful for people besides Michael J. In fact, it's until, exclusively like, for people not Michael up J. Up until like a week ago, you were just saying like all of the big tournaments were won by red. Yeah, I know. Hartford was won by red. That's how fast That's how fast things red. change. Like It's <laughs> it's in the first tier. But if I take blue white dreadnought, if 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 things happen the way that I think they should, which is I think that more people should play blue white dreadnought. Then, then burn is then burn has to be lower. I think if people burn is don't play, blue white dreadnought. I know it, you, it, I, Mike. I know that you think that. I'm trying to make this useful for other people because other people are just not going to one. They're not going to put four mog salvage in their sideboard, and two, like they're not going to feel like it's a good matchup. Like I agree that we have a plan, right? Like we know what we want to do for for the burn matchup, but um. The way that I would put it is that if there's not a lot of dreadnought, then burn is going to be good. And if there is a lot of dreadnought, you're going to have a hard time. Like, because the the problem is if you're wrong, right? Like, uh, again, we talked, we, we basically said, okay, we made, uh, we lose a lot of game ones with burn. We probably are uh, 20% 
or 25 percent to win game one but we're 75 percent to win games two and three with our awesome mock salvage plan right so we concocted a slightly favored matchup through this exercise you and if it like a 54 yeah, yeah. win rate and yeah. if we're wrong right if we're like a little bit wrong and we overshot how good monk salvage is then then it's not a good matchup still right so like i get i i'm with you okay i think that burn can be blue eyed dreadnought i think you should play for monk salvage i think you should slow play the beat down i think you should play perfectly and i think that even if you do all that there's a possibility that you're going to go X and two losing to dreadnought twice because you got a little unlucky. One of your smog salvages was an overload, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Gross. Um, cause if I put like, that's the thing is like, if I put like, I actually really like this continuum of dreadnought goblins and oath because it's very elegant because all of those decks actually have play against each other. They're all kind of in the 40, 60 range. Like I think, goblins is probably 60 against dreadnought i think it's probably 45 against oath i think oath is probably like you know maybe depending on the oath it's either dead even or unfavored against dreadnought and i think it's like slightly favored against goblins so you have these three decks that are really good at beating um all of the other decks in the metagame and they're they're a tough fight against each other like nobody's gonna if you uh if you play any of these three decks and you sit down for, across from an opponent um, and they're playing not one of those three decks, you're going to feel great. And if they're playing one of those three decks, you're still going to you're like, it's going to be a battle. Um, so that's very elegant. And I think burn um, could look really bad into, uh, you know, into goblins, which it seems to lose to like at least 40% of the time, like maybe 45, right? Um, I think that goblins is slightly favored against burn, but I don't think that it is. I don't think it is a blowout on either side versus caffeinated used to think that red was a huge favorite. And I, I never understood why, but it seems to me that it is a small favorite, if any kind of a favorite. And I would guess goblins is slightly favored. Yeah. I mean, I'm just going to put burn at the top of tier two. I think one of the issues with burn is that it has those random things below tier two, where it's just like, Oh, like, bad against enchantress bad against uh you know oh yeah yeah, yeah. burn is like uh <laughs> the best thing i can think about is just like the one of the best statistics the cleveland cavaliers have this year is they have the best record against teams with a losing record yeah they're like insane against if you're at a losing record the Cavs just raffle stomp you by like 40 points and they have the best record against teams with a losing record this year and the weird thing is just like the boston celtics will just randomly lose to a shitty team or something right like and I think that's like burn. Like burn could totally lose to attack in tier three. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that's that's kind of the the hang up I have about that deck where it's just like I don't know if I yeah like I said it's like if I'm playing blue white dreadnought and I just like sit down and my opponent is playing not goblins oath blue or blue white dreadnought then I'm gonna be like cool I got this. If I play burn and my opponent like is playing enchantress for example I'm just gonna be like oh shit like <laughs> that's annoying. Like, and there's only, there's only ever like one or two in the room and I found them. Um, or of course, like, like I played against Enchantress three times. <laughs> at Ball. Yeah. I mean, the last time I played against, uh, uh, the last time I played burn, um, like, I, I mean, I just, I sent you the screenshot. I have like, I had the circle of protection covered cause I had three Jackal pups and two lava mans and two mog fan in place. So my opponent was just tapping seven mana in turn, but they had circle of protection and warmth. Oh, that's you can't beat two different things. I know. Of them as a yeah, circle. exactly. If, if, if it's just a circle, you, you got it. Them. Yeah, yeah. But if it if it's if it's a circle in an arcane lab, a circle in a chill, a circle, a circle in a, a sphere. Warm, yeah, you're yeah. Circle in a sphere is, is good enough too. It, yeah, circle in a sphere is a little less good enough because Jackal Pups does a lot of work against circle in a sphere. But if they, yeah, if they're hitting land drops, then you know yeah, like, they'll get there. But yeah, so um at the yeah at the end of the day like that kind of i mean that's always what's holding burn down it's that like before burn was winning tournaments right it was like pretty good at top eighting it was like a pretty good like make it to the top eight and then the top eight was all good decks and it was like okay really hard to win three straight from there you've done it i've seen you do it right we saw you do it we saw Bryn do it um players have been doing it uh i mean you know flint even uh 
you know, Flint won a won a monthly with Burn with a monthly Goblin Patrol. Aaron almost won a monthly. Yeah, it's true. So it happens, but um, I still put more um, more predictability on uh, you know the the good decks being good. Fun fun little tidbit: uh, we finally got the breakdown from the online event. There were four pilots on the red green uh, Oath Pluge deck. So uh, I don't uh, so. Pablo uh, Paul Master was playing it. He didn't carbon copy France. The winner did carbon copy France, and then I don't know what the other two pilots did. Um, but uh, I, I will say a one of four conversion is a lot less convincing than um, you know than calling it the best deck in pre modern would suggest. But uh, Pablo did get ninth place, so it's close. Um, um, are we? In agreement that blue white twelve twelve is the best. I think I think goblins is the best deck. I think what is goblins afraid of? Goblins is just afraid of um, enchantress allegedly. Again, no way. Again, not something. Never lost that matchup in my life. Not something that I agree with, but enchantress players are like, oh, we beat every deck with creatures, and we're like, okay, sure. Um, uh goblins How? goblins is like afraid of burn i mean a percentage there, of the time <laughs> there are some situations right like if they get the if if they somehow assemble the opalescence parallax wave combo and no one ever pressured them then i guess that but like people with like sacred mesa like you can't even damage them, well sacred right? mesa like, sacred mesa Sacred Mesa is like not even um, Sacred Mesa is is no longer a card in Enchantress. Like we just use it to make fun of Enchantress players, but none of them actually play it anymore. Like just um, Andrew Walker played it against. Yeah, but Walker hasn't. Oh. Walker is playing the same like Enchantress seventy five that he's been playing. You know, like all all the people who are like aggressively updating and grinding the deck like have cut Sacred Mesa a long time ago. All, all I'm saying is, I mean, Goblins play Cam had Tranquil Domain. Cam, because they needed it and it's good against it's very good against enchantress because you have pressure yeah i agree i mean can uh, like, again like i'm just gonna leave it as like enchantress just shouldn't even be a deck so like whatever but yeah goblins I is mean, goblins fear is nothing i actually think the two best decks into into goblins are lanny rock and grow talk lanny grow talk because lanny grow talk is insane because it has like a ton of blockers and then it just has 12 cantrips into four engineered plague um, but didn't you used to think that goblins was favored? I used to, but then, then I then I played against I goblins stopped players. losing to goblins. Like I was just like, wait, yeah, like I I mean I I I I'm just not behind burn anymore. And my main reason for not being behind burn anymore is you've optimized Lanny Groatog in such a way that I just don't think I have an edge anymore. Like outside of game one, and I I don't I don't I wouldn't have beaten you if you didn't mulligan to five. That yeah. that's the. Yeah, and if I, I had the I had fourth, a, if I had the fourth copy of Chill, we talked about that. No, I literally had. I looked at my opening hand. I'm on. Like, I, I'm like, this hand is perfect. I had a perfect hand, and I barely beat you on a mulligan to five. Yeah. So I mean, my five was was four perfects and one not, and that's that made the difference. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, I think yeah, I think that the rock, um, like Lanny Rock with like Call the Herds and Phyrexian Ragers is like pretty good against goblins because it has a lot of blockers and it has a lot of value. And then it sideboards into four engineered plague. Um I think that um Grotog is just super sick because twelve cantrips plus four engineered plague means you're putting two in play and like you're blocking on the way, right? Because like Psychotog is also great. Oh, the deck has four fire ice and and four like three sword supplies after board too. It's you just, just like, have to live a little bit, right? You just barely have to live. Like you just make sure you keep a hand that beats Lackey, and then like you can just draw any. Co- I mean, that's the beauty of Grotog. It's just that like, um, that's I mean, actually a I good. Hate to, that's a. Uh, I hate to disappoint you. Look what I found. Oh, there, there we go. Four old bordered. But they're old plane so I didn't even I, I found rides. these before I got to the got to the, the ugly ones. ones. Um, so I have to play these ones, right? Um, but actually, so go- goblins uh, basically just fears um, fears. These are three different printings, and I don't have four copies of a single printing of this, which is humiliating. Uh, well, then you just play one of each, and then uh, one random one. But um, uh, he's showing fire ices to, to the people who don't have the video feed. Um, 
Anyways. And we only play two of this even though he's gas? Yeah. You just can't right. fit the third. You literally can't fit the third Psychotog in the deck. I've tried. Anyway, I obviously put together the deck. So. It's happening. It has to go in sleeves. It's all coming up. Millhouse. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that Goblins, like, obviously Goblins, uh, Goblins, I guess, is probably bad against playable Dead Guy Ale because that deck has, like, plenty of removal. This is, like, Goblins is bad oh. against removal decks, right? I, I've played that matchup one time. I was Goblins against Matt P playing playable Dead Guy Ale. Um, I beat him, but he had, like, a weird sideboard with, like, this O3 wall that gains life. Yeah, that's not like a that's not data. Yeah, so like <laughs> I just attack with everything and just sacrifice the guy that he blocks to skirt prospector and he never gained life. Yeah. Right. So um so that was weird. And then uh, but he got me game one. Like just like point removal, Gerard's yeah. verdict is awesome. Yeah, plus I mean plus like Wrath of God just like, you know, helps clean up and then eventually you cast Exalted Angel. And it's like if I you cast like- Wrath into Exalted Angel, it's like pretty solid. I think playable Dead Guy Ale is pretty good against twelve twelve, right? It's pretty good. I agree. I think it's I think it's, it's I think it's like pretty good against goblins, and I think it's very good against red green. Is it tier one? Because um, it's also it's great against like if, let's talk about random decks. Playable Dead Guy Ale can beat red, right? I don't I, I don't want that matchup, but it can beat red. Um it crushes land still, right? Uh, I beat elves the last time I played that matchup. It's good against playable Grotog. Maybe, maybe playable dead guy ale is good. It's possible. I think it's like I think in the the whole like Cataclysm Geddon thing is like too large of a hole. I, I beat three Armageddon's the night that I played it. That's the yeah, thing but I, I mean, I'm just I'm just saying like it has to be like a try hard Armageddon situation, right? Like, I mean, draw six with skeletal scrying gets you, gets yeah. you out of a lot of, yeah, it gets, it puts you in a, a good spot, behind. but there's yeah, like, like, there's also decks that have parallax tied and there's also decks that have like, like, Oh yeah. Like Savannah this lions, just like the, the age old rifter problem. Like you can't beat somebody who has concerted attack on your mana. Like not, I mean, you can beat somebody who's trying to stone rain you. I don't think you can beat somebody who has like a lot of one sided Armageddon. Yeah, exactly. And green white is going to sideboard in a cataclysm and Armageddon. Now I think if we're playing off France latest, we've got three, three cat as main one. Okay. So no, it's still four copies, but, um, uh, I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's like compelling. I think the deck is, is, is a uh, is possible it's definitely really yeah like you said it's really good against um green red because it just is good at hitting land drops and playing through sphere resistance and like just having derpy value right um and not like not triggering triggering oath of druids until it matters um so yeah i can just like never go- triggering oath of druids if you don't want to who cares is there um is you there a mass indicate the oath. is there no real mass land destruction spell in red there's lots of mass land destruction spells in red. Not really like Jockle Hops, Wildfire. Um, does Jockle Hops do it? Apocalypse. Uh, maybe that's yeah, maybe that's the sideboard. That's maybe that's the best. I, Jockle Hops is a little iffy because it blows up your Mox Diamond and Sphere Resistance. Yeah, but Wildfire doesn't. Wildfire, Wildfire only just... picks up four though, which like. Isn't yeah, but that's right. but that's good in a deck that has an imbalance of land, right? If we both sacrifice four, and I also blow up your other th- two or something with thermocarsts, then, then that's I'm quite good. a bit ahead, right? Like wildfire is double red pip though. It's a little awkward. I mean, you'll I mean, you'll get to it against black white, but aren't you just better off playing stunted growth or uh, plow under then? I don't know. I don't know if you capitalize on the. Um, uh, capitalize on the tempo because the thing is black white is is very far ahead in card advantage right so like if it was a close race oh, it, here's a deck that has multiple engines actually right yeah, yeah. there's more than one engine and scrying and in, 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 in internal dragon and internal well, I mean, dragon even is like decree is uh is, yeah yeah is a value well decree right? doesn't decree doesn't line up well against oath so like i don't yeah, love it here vindicate does yeah vindicate's actually insane against uh against red green Red green probably it, can't do anything to win. 
It's like pro- it's got to be impossible. The scrying is so so good against them. Like that's the. There was one. And also, it has Dust Bowl. Dust Bowl is the best card. Against there is a <laughs> one right. black white control player from uh, the challenge, and they didn't make top eight. Um, so either they didn't find the matchups or they didn't win them. But um, yeah, and there's no black white control in. Um, another 1K that was reported that uh, Goblins won, although it was a 1K with no top cut, it sounded like. Um, I'll, I'll have to wait till somebody corrects me on that. Um, so we have... So we have... Because because uh, Grotog satisfies that test, too. Like, Grotog beats Goblins uh, is... Like, I'm not sure about the Oath matchup, but I, you know, I won it one time. And I'm not sure about the Dreadnought matchup, because I actually never play it. <laughs> But I'm like pretty sure it spreads really well into those decks. Um, in addition to beating elves, in addition to having a winnable sideboard plan versus burn that you're very confident will work, um, it's great against replenish. It is good against hermit fed, but hermit fed can sneak it in. It's bad against uh, both flavors of the rock, um, and it's bad against the more mid ranged cousin it has in the blue white weenie deck, um, and it's bad against enchantress. Um, Grotog's bad against Enchantress. Yeah, Grotog is not doesn't line up well against Enchantress because uh, it has to uh, like try to play good enough suppression on the engine, um, and then also establish um, like a clock at the same time because it can't like Grotog doesn't beat engines right so it's not great against a resolve survival of fittest so yeah it's bad against blue green scroll op um so it's like not it's like really bad against uh, resolve survival of fittest but it's really good at beating survival of fittest because between meddling mage uh sideboard rave revelation and then engineered plague you kind of like blend to be like okay against uh, all the things that they want to accomplish in their life you're you've got something you have something for but you do have to draw it right like if they just like turn to survival you under meddling mage under days and then they just like start accruing value like a deranged hermit stops your entire deck like just one deranged hermit blocks like a five times so like you know good luck but um you pretty much have to to make the stop there like in fact that's actually what happened like i like was playing against squirrel op they got the survival down so then i, I they got the survival done under meddling mage so then i had to go meddling mage naming trade wind rider meddling mage name opposition and then we played like 20 more turns they drew two oh, cards but then a turn. he has real card advantage and you have like yeah, he like picks up mana wars. Like, and, like, yeah, you have, have like mox diamond. And, yeah, I have mox diamond. Yeah, and like, yeah. it's horrible. Um, you, you need to you need to close the games quickly when you're that kind of a deck. Yeah, like basically you would need like double Korean dryad plus like you know crucial timing counters and like whatever. But uh, it's really hard to beat like engines because your entire deck is one for ones and you're just like trying to slice out value. So um, I did I ever tell you this story? Over the course of time, I. I tested a bunch of different sideboard strategies against Jund and the Rock in Modern with my red decks. So I was just like, oh, these cards all seem pretty good, right? So I was playing in a regional PTQ in Utah with my red deck, and I, I played against Land's brother in the last round. And I'm like, I beat, I win game one. I'm like, um, neither of us can make top eight now, so I'm going to experiment a bunch of different strategies. We actually both ended up qualifying with the Pro Tour. We just didn't happen to qualify at, that, at this one, right? So... Um, uh, and so I, I cited in my Relic of Progenitus to fight against his Tarmogoyfs, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, and they also draw a card. So I tried that. In other tournaments, I tried like, oh, what if I just try to play Gear One, right? Like all these people who like they all try to play Gear One. Why don't I try to play Gear One? And the conclusion that I came to, because I never won any of those games, right? So I just always went back to how I wanted to sideboard, was like. The red deck just looks horrible if you like line its cards up against other people's cards. Right. Never wins, right? You need to line you you need your strategy to beat their strategy, right? Because like I'm like all of these cards, like Relic of Progenitus against Tarmogoyf seems great, you know? Like I made your Tarmogoyf zero one. I'm like just didn't accomplish anything. And it ended up losing to their planeswalker, you know? Um, because I just had these cards that didn't do any damage in my deck, you know? So it sounds to me like you need Grotog's strategy to line up and beat these other people's deck, not like an individual card to beat their individual card. Because they just have more of them. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's kind of, uh, I mean, that's it. And that's actually kind of the weird things like as grow talks, just really bad against wall blossoms in Phyrexian rager. <laughs> it's just like, Oh, like this means I can't Your advance. Cards got yeah. You. It's like, I can't advance. Well, no, their strategy is like, um, so are you familiar with uh, Sam Black's like big game, small game paradigm? Uh, maybe, but maybe not in those words. So uh, he uses basically like ravenous rats versus elvish visionary, right? Like some decks like want to play a ravenous rats game and some decks want to play a, an elvish visionary game and visionary beats rats, right? Like you're, you're well, sometimes you don't have any cards in hand. So rats didn't generate any card advantage. Yeah. That's one yeah. big, that's one big reason. Um, but um, it gets a little bit more complicated because uh, the, the way he uses in his article about talking about big game, small game is just like there are cards that vote for a big game and their cards that vote for a small game. And the rock is an interesting blend because um, generally speaking decks like the rock play a small game. There's not like a lot of permanence in play. There's not like a lot of material, Um, even though they have cards that vote for bigger games uh, with like example being wall of blossoms, but wall blossoms to feel cabal therapy. Right. Um, But um, drange termit also produces a big game the the antithesis of this is like a tribal aggro deck like uh, a, a deck that wants to put like a lot of creatures and each creature you add to the battlefield has like exponential reward right so um you know a mog fanatic is not a good small game card like it's good in the sense that you can sometimes trade it for a one one but it's even better when it's putting two extra power into a pile driver um and so uh Grotog basically only votes for a small game. It converts all of its resources into tempo, right? Using Mox Diamond, Days, Foil, and like uses Gush to power Foil, right? Um, so any any material advantage you gain from Gush, you just like sink it right away into one for one of your opponent down to them at zero and you at one, and then that's match, right? So the Rock is really good against fighting that because the Rock doesn't have any like vulnerability points where like oh you countered my you know you countered my card because like all my cards are just every single card in my deck is a 44 out of 100 yeah it's just a thing (laughs) every single one yeah and if you're a mix of yeah and that's a big thing it's like if you're a mix of like okay i've got a few aces and like a bunch of cards that become aces in the presence of my ace then grotog is going to punish you because they're going to just counter your ace but i'm gonna smother i'm gonna smother your key card yeah (laughs) um vendetta that (laughs) Um, so I think it's like interesting in thinking about like uh, there's a three three uh, big game small <laughs> game because even though the rock plays a small game, um, Grotog is trying to contain the game and and rock is impossible to contain because all the cards are just like I have fire X and Rager. Yeah, like the rock is like I don't know who the hell is the rock. The rock is like Iron Fist or Shang Chi, right? Like pretty good at kung fu right you know they're world class at kung fu okay (laughs) like got on the avengers that's how good i am at kung fu am i iron fist i could punch out a dragon that's how good i am at kung fu they're not superman right yeah (laughs) i could punch a dragon they're they're not they're not the hulk some some may say that the rock is iron man and some decks are the hulk (laughs) so uh but the thing is they also got no kryptonite. Yeah, so exactly. Erase their knowledge of kung fu. Like, <laughs> like, oh, I got you. Like, how? I got no kryptonite. Yeah, yeah there's no like, kryptonite. What are you going to do perfect. to me? Yeah. Are you going to unlearn my kung fu? <laughs> um, yeah, and it actually makes it interesting because, like, the, the rock deck is somehow better than Oath Pollution decks against Grotok. Like I, I know I keep on saying like the Oath Flush is just better rock, right? The like the Oath Flush is like it's like pocket jacks every time. Um <laughs> and it's just like, you know, you're you have no aces, but you have no you have no seven deuce. And like um uh and and like basically sometimes sometimes you you flop a set or whatever. Like basically like sometimes the cards line up for you, but the cards on their own are like pretty strong. Maybe it's ace king all the time. It's like ace king all the time. You always have ace high and sometimes you pair the board. Like you pair the board because you had like turn one sphere against a deck that's vulnerable to sphere, or you have turn one oath against a deck that ran out land where elves. But the rest I mean, of the time, you're just ace highing. Better them. than pocket jacks. That's 
Well, ironically, Pocket Jacks is stronger than than Ace King, so it's it's hard to. Uh, I mean, it's it, Ace uh, King wins more hands than Pocket Jacks. No, no, Jacks, Jacks, Jacks has more equity heads up against Ace King. Oh, in a in a two person game. Yeah, and heads up. Yeah, right. Like in a ring game, though. Like, yes, it becomes more complicated. But let's bear with me. Yeah, um, obviously, a pair is better than Ace High. Uh, uh. Well, no, it's just Pocket it just deuces beats. No, 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 no. Pocket deuces is behind. I'm talking about equity in the hand. Pocket deuces is behind against Ace King. Tens, tens, pocket tens is roughly equal to uh, Ace King off. It's like a forty nine fifty one. But Heads Jax, up. yeah, but Jax has like has like six percent on um on Ace King preflop. So uh, why is that? Aren't isn't every single pair that's a, an under pair like equally a pair? No, because uh, uh, Jax will. Uh, that's actually a good question. Um, I just conceptually don't understand why. In a ring game, I understand. Heads up, I don't understand. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Somebody who knows who's good at poker. Uh, no, I'm just saying if if you're literally playing heads, yeah, yeah, up, you're just yeah. I know, I know what you're saying. Your pair seems to me the same. So to be equal equity. I mean, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, they they always call it a flip. Okay, maybe I'm mistaken. Other than you would, uh, other than you, maybe you're less likely to bet on a pair of deuces than a pair of jacks. Like, uh, so that might change things. But you know, why doesn't the, the case? A low BK pocket. sent me uh, like a map of like all of the hands in order for a heads up game like years ago. Yeah, yeah, the the, the range, the betting range, and it should no, have just like it should if have you're some in this squares. You should do this, oh, right? Okay. Like that might be for limit. Um, <laughs> if BK is like an old school poker grinder, it might be for limit hold'em. Do you know? Uh, I it, it's this was like twenty, this was like nineteen years ago, so I don't yeah. remember. Because limit limit uh, is kind of solved. Um as a higher but it was literally like every hand in order and what you should do in this situation taking off so if you're just like playing against chinese bots or something like this would have been a, probably a pretty good strategy i don't know if it's a pretty good strategy against daniel the yeah i mean i uh, the, the problem that we always have um uh being uh uh the the problem uh with uh being uh, bringing poker into this is that i'm not like i'm not like a poker savant i have a very cursory knowledge of poker so um uh like it's it's a whole thing um but uh yeah i don't know um uh you you make a good point but that's like that's already far derailed my point is that like uh surprisingly um i guess just because uh yeah, I mean, actually, it really is just how much Oath Pollution leans on exactly Oath of Druids and Swords of Plowshares. And, like, those are just, like, things... So, actually, those, here's a good example. Like, the reason why Burn is so much better against um, Grotog than, uh, than Oath Pollution is, is that Burn has a lot more differently named removal. So, even though Burn can't deal with the Psychotog, like... Burn can deal with every other creature very efficiently, whereas like Oath Plush, like Swords of Plowsharing, um, you know, Ocarian Dryad is like much harder for the Oath Plush deck to accomplish because it only has four copies of Swords of Plowshares, and Swords of Plowshares is probably being named by Meddling Mage. So um that was my point, is that Grotog better against Oath Plush than it is uh, against the rock somehow, even though Oath Plush is just the rock, but better. Um but maybe well no it's not it's so i think maybe grotog is bad against any decks that are just about individual card efficiency versus so like um traditionally up until recently grotog is also behind against burn right um but, but behind burn and the rock no, I'm just saying I'm making an example of yeah, 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 deck yeah, yeah, yeah. That it was behind, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's also behind against playable Dead Guy Ale, right? Yeah. Playable Dead Guy Ale is probably the most of all the decks in pre modern, it's literally just like 40 bangers, right? Like every single card is sweet. It's just like yeah. Swords of Pleasure is sweet. You know, Jordan's verdict is not impressing anybody, but every it's really good against Grotok. It's really good 
if you're just trading resources, yeah. you know, like Eternal Dragon, sweet, Exalted Angel, sweet. Like if you're just like forty bangers, like Fran did get to- Fran did get cracked by. Um, he was playing playable Dead Guy into Grotog, and he did get cracked by Grotog and uh, you know, Winter Orbs and Armageddon's, obviously. Yeah, I mean, you can't let them Armageddon you. <laughs> That is certainly I mean, the truth. You can't stop them, right? That's that's yeah, yeah. one thing. But you gotta you gotta make it not hurt that bad. And like it's it's not that hard to stop it. Like you, you could stop on four land in that deck, five maybe five land, so that you can like plausibly uh, rebuy your your Eternal Dragon. But like it, it's not that easy for Groatug to keep guys in play, right? Like Wrath of God will resolve against you, right? You just set it up with a Duress or Gerard's Verdict, and then you cast Wrath of God and. Multiple guys. Yeah, I mean, you're you're gonna do you know, the way the Grotog player has to play it is is to is to not give give away any free two for ones and cast a lot of gush basically. Um, like if you just solo out a um, if you solo out a uh, like if you have like mage mage plus dryad, um, you're uh, you're gonna be like uh, in a good spot. To like have enough counterspell pa- coverage for like duress wrath because like you could also like you know cover duress wrath with like days counterspell it's not the worst you could how also name wrath with meddling mage if 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 you have how to. many hours is this podcast are we at three no we're at two twenty it's it's time to call it I I I I don't know man anyone who's still here God bless I'll let you pick my deck at the next event if you're still here. Message me on uh, first person to message me on uh, pre modern for non idiots. Like I got to the end of the podcast. The deck you're playing is blah. I will play. I will play that deck. Oh, I and, love this. Not, like, it, has to, it has to be a real deck. Like it can't just be like you have to play. Yeah, yeah. Veto, you you reserve veto power. Pokemon deck. You reserve right? veto power. But if somebody says like you know a deck that you own and like isn't BS, like you're you're in. No, it could be BS. I mean, like, it could be like BS. It could be like Lanny Groatog. I'd play it. That's not BS. I'm talking like <laughs> make them force you to play uh, uh, Pit Rack. <laughs> I would play. If you are the first person and you get there, I will play. Pit, I, I don't know if I have the cards for Pit Rack. Yeah, you don't have the cards. But I would theoretically play Pit, pit Rack. Uh, Do you have a printer, on, Mike? Do you have a FedEx office? Oh, my God. I'm not doing that, man. I know. Yeah, I know. I'm doing. Where is it? I'm doing now. I'm ruined, right? This was like the best worst gift ever. Now it wasn't even a gift. I paid for it. I paid money for it. But now, now it is stranded. <laughs> what am I gonna do with this? Mike is holding up a solitary foreign black bordered city of brass, which he has no accompaniment for. Grotog of place, of course, plays four copies. So um, unless Mike uses promo code Flores at Cool Stuff Inc., I don't even know There's, how much they FBB. They don't have them there. Yeah, they don't have FBBs. Um, if they use uh, promo code Spy Colony at uh, foilbug.com, uh, you can uh, uh, hopefully find a, a foil Japanese ones for yourself that, of course, don't exist. There are foil uh, of the Arabians, though, like Arabian art. It was like a promo. And those are like very expensive. Those are like $800. Yeah, those are unreal expensive. But. Um, yeah um thank you for listening to us thank you for bearing with um the inconsistent podcast schedule um i'm kind of like i'm so hyped today like fran was like well, you're just your birthday party yesterday well fran well it's just because fran was just like red green's like the best deck in pre-modern i'm like fran other people have to play the deck and do well in order for me to think that it like deserves its place in tier one it's like one one day two later other people win yeah two it. two yeah. other people win swiss tournaments like swiss per- tournaments with top eight cuts with it and i'm just like i guess fran was yeah. right <laughs> just like, i was like i'm not saying it's not the best deck i'm just saying that like it can't just I be will. you i don't think it's the best deck. um i was like I, it can't just be you right um uh i think uh you know i i think that goblins is kind of like the the underrated like the underrated deck because it's like so good but it's kind of tricky and obviously it gets beat and so like maybe i'm overrating goblins because there's like enough variance to like there, there's enough things that are outside of your control but um who's to say um overall uh you know great job fran great job to billy out in uh worcester um billy notably uh 
is the secret uh, Tesla to um, Fran's Edison. After Fran uh, debuted his red green list, uh, Billy chimed in. He's like, "Hey, I, I've, I've actually, I actually did the red splash before." And and Fran was like, "Oh, that's funny. I've never heard of your your version, but that's cool." Um, anyways. Um, I'm still going to call it Oath Bloosh. Sorry, I'm not going to call it Billy Bloosh. Although I could. That'd be kind of funny. Um, Billy Tyrant Bloosh. Um, but, you know, credit where it's due. Um, py- you know, all the deck needed was some pyroclasm and to cut, uh, you know, exploration and etc. cetera. So um, Fran's record with red green is 9040335040. Yes. But you know, none of those players had Sabo's web, so yeah. And in the three, I mean, he didn't play enough, play against enough Dreadnought opponents. He kind of punted his Dreadnought game on camera um, against Kaplan. Against Kaplan, where he like it, it wasn't like a line that would win, but it was like he just took a sub uh, like a clearly suboptimal line, um, and maybe it affected the outcome. Like we don't know. Like if if it basically was like just a position where like if Kaplan has like one counter spell, it's he, he's probably still good, but um, like one extra counter spell that he just didn't have to show Fran. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I think the deck is super real. Um, I don't think it's the best deck in pre modern because I still think you know goblins and blue eyed dreadnought like have pretty good claim. But now that we've kind of rehashed the tier list, I can I could say I'm willing to say that it's close enough between um the three decks in tier one that i would i would say that on any given day i can't believe that you kicked like red has more good finishes than red green oath pollution in the last month and you kicked it out of tier one well it doesn't anymore like now now it's the last month in the last 30 days now it's more i mean but that's the thing it's like well and they're bigger well the trend is uh they're they're like they're it close won $2, enough. Two thousand dollars. It won three. It actually won all three thousand dollars tournaments that have happened. No, the so volleyball was too was is too small to count if you want to use that level of rigor because volleyball is okay, smaller than both of the tournaments that um, Red Green won today. <laughs> okay, and the one like because the thing is the um, the turnout on the online challenges is the largest of the bunch. It's it's over thirty six, so it's a real six rounder. Um, or over 32 so they're real six rounders um and each round that you add is like pretty big data right and here's the big ant for the online challenges there's no unintentional or there's no intentional draws so you also can't just like you know four or double draw in in those tournaments um so uh i think that uh, so it's you know, a six round tournament, not a three round. It's a real, yeah, it's a real six round tournament. You can't sneak in if you start O two, for example. <laughs> Just saying, I don't know, I don't know who would who, what kind of man man would do that. Maybe, but maybe someone with a lot of plot armor. Yeah, but um. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, my, my, I, we just hashed it out, Mike. Like sometimes you lose to like a random enchantress guy on on burn, and uh, you know that's gonna ruin your day, and that's just less likely to happen to you um, if you're playing um, like one of the more solid lists. Um, so yeah, you heard it here first. We are in the goblins, oath Plush, and blue white dreadnought era of pre modern love spy colony. Love Sabo's fucking web. Get in there. Game over.